Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 158, The Bellhop's Best of 2021. Tonight, after an absence, we're back to wrap up the year. I'm Sean, and with me, Mo, the Tabletop Bellhop himself. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. Yes, we are finally back for one last show of 2021, which you are probably hearing at the start of 2022 since we release podcast episodes on Tuesday, but we release record Wednesdays. What we are going to be talking about tonight are the best games we played this year, share our biggest gaming surprise of the year, and I'm going to review one of the best games that was released this year in 2021. It is Land vs. Sea from Good Games Publishing. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment on our topic of great board games for historical miniature wargamers. Patreon of the show, Brian Sheen writes, I feel 300 Earth and Water is a good one for the list. Well, thanks for the suggestion, Brian. Uh, my only concern with this particular Cubes on a Map game is that it's only a 30-minute playtime. While I'm personally curious about a 30-minute Battle of Thermopylae, I worry half an hour isn't going to be enough to satiate your average war gamer. I think most historical war gamers are expecting to sit down for three to 12 hour games. So I don't know if a quick filler with lots of cubes would satisfy that itch, but there is a chance. Yeah, no, yeah, there are war gamers of all types. They don't all like to sit there for a day or two. Fair enough. Now, leading up to the holidays, we republished our great non game gifts for gamers article, which led to these comments. Dave Wood writes, I'm hoping one of these is bookshelves to hold those extra games and make way for more. And Cindy commented, I got this for my son, who is a tabletop gamer. A travel dice set in a Celtic knot pattern stainless steel matchbox. They have other designs, a dragon, cat, bear, bird. Neat, because the box is stainless steel and wood, tough enough for life in his backpack. Now, what I will do is I'll drop a link to that in the show notes so people can check out these not work dice holders, dice packs. So thank you both, uh, David and Cindy. I agree bookshelves would be a great gift, though I think in general the price range of a bookshelf is higher than most gift givers are willing to spend. But one, fair, one thing I do want to point out is if you are buying someone a bookshelf, I don't think that should be a surprise gift. That's not the thing you just show up with a flat pack from Ikea for. I think in that case, you probably want to talk to the person ahead of time or tell them you will buy them a bookcase and then work with them to find something that actually fits, whether that fits in their home or fits with the right um, decor, the right colors and all that. Uh, you want to make sure that you're getting something they're actually going to want and use in their house. And that matchbox dice box, excuse me, that matchbox dice box is gorgeous looking. I do really dig the bat pattern on it. We actually did get our daughter a bookshelf, but it was for books, not games, and I was the one who put most of it together. Oh, of course. <laughs> now, next, I hate assembling. Why is assembling bookshelves so terrible? You know what? People joke about Ikea, but those people haven't made things from non-Ikea, because really, Ikea yes. does it right. The number of things that were in the wrong order in this particular instruction mm -hmm. book was frustrating. And finally, by, by the time I was in the second half, I made sure to read ahead and do go back and then and do the, those other things it's like that are going to get in the way once you yeah and i gotta anyway. say the the ikea tools that are well frustrating are still way better than needing three different screwdrivers as well as a hammer and finishing nails to put your thing together absolutely all right well next a comment from the winner of our roll camera giveaway ethan lean writes i'm really happy to have discovered you guys on reddit you guys really run a great service Thanks, Ethan. I'm happy to see that we're at least a thing on Reddit and that people are actually finding us through there. Due to their, I'll say it, ridiculous rules about self-promotion, I don't actually post there that often at all. And anytime I do link to our stuff, it gets deleted by the mods. So it usually takes someone else pointing people our way for us to even end up on Reddit. So welcome to the fold, Ethan. I'm glad you did find us and I hope you're enjoying your copy of Roll Camera. We really probably should set up our own subreddit, 
so that we get to set the rules, but I don't know anything about running moderation on such on Reddit's. It's just another place to post, and I don't know if it's worth keeping up over there as well. I don't know. Maybe it's something to look at in the new year. Well, we also got a comment from Raul Rempen, who's the designer of our roll camera on our review. Mal wrote, thanks, guys. Glad you liked it. And yes, it's Malachi. Right. I typo. That's Mal Rempen. Right, Mal. Malachi. Ah, there we go. That makes way more sense. That does make more so sense. So we're just going to mess up your name every time we talk about you, Mal. I am sorry about that. Um, I admit I should have got that one when I was reading. Like, it's spelled Malachi. It just, I guess, I think in the same review or the one before had a bunch of other names. I had a hard time. I, it's my bad. I'm there's sorry. A, and we just did it again. There's um, a reason why I put the uh, the names up in print on all of yes. our reviews. That way you can see them. We need that for the live show, too, because obviously I can't read. Um, so yeah, thanks for the comment and thanks for the fantastic game. We are still loving uh, Roll Camera, and I am looking forward to checking out the uh, the B Movie expansion maybe sometime in the next year. Well, next up, John wrote us to ask a question about the Shining Escape from Overlook Hotel. When playing the game, we were instructed to open Act Two's envelope, but there wasn't anything in it. Maybe something fell out. Does anybody know what was supposed to be in it? So hey, John, you're all good. There's nothing that's meant to be in the big envelope that says Act 2. It exists so that you can save your game between Act 1 and 2, which you may not want to do. Like, that's only something you're going to do if you're going to split the game over two sessions instead of playing it through all in one. Now, when you save, the game book tells you what you need to put in that envelope, and it's everything you're going to need in Act 2. And to be honest, this is worth doing if even if you are playing through straight through because it lets you clear off the table and get stuff you no longer need out of the way and back into the original envelopes. And then when you start back up, say a week later, you're going to pull it out and you're going to be like, oh, what do we need for Act 2? Well, it's all in that envelope. You just dump it on the table. So the part about opening it up and taking the stuff out is listed in the rules and is only needed if you chose to save your game. It's not needed normally. Now, to be honest, I can't remember how the rulebook is written for this. And this was our second Coded Chronicles game. So to me, it was obvious what the envelope was for because that's how it worked in Scooby-Doo. Um, because of other issues we saw with The Shining, there is a chance it isn't properly addressed in the rules. But you're not missing anything. Your game's as complete as it's supposed to be. All right. Well, finally, we got some, exci- we got some excitement with our This Didn't Happen preview on our last episode. Brett Slocum says, take my money. Well, you're going to have to wait a week or two, Brett. Um, this one's going to hit Kickstarter. It's supposed to be the beginning of January. Um, from what I remember, it's supposed to be the second week, if nothing's changed. Like the last I've heard, it was supposed to go live on the 9th or 10th. It was in that area. And I'm sure whenever it does go live, I will be sharing links. So I'll be trying to remember to go back to our content and include links to what we've already got out there in case people check it out. And the Kickstarter should have links to our reviews kind of going back and forth that way. So I am excited in a way it, it's cool to see that people want to check this game out because we gave it i think a very thorough and fair review and people are listening to that and going no this still sounds like something i want to check out because there is a lot of neat stuff going on there for a time travel game. well that's it for this week's comments send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media One quick announcement before we get on to our main topic tonight. As of last week, Spotify has added the ability to review podcasts on the mobile version of the Spotify app. Sadly, as far as I can tell, this feature has not rolled out on desktop, but I have to assume it's coming. So this is one of our infrequent reminders that it would be awesome if you took the time to review our show, especially on Spotify but now also other places like Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Audible, really anywhere you can review us, it certainly won't hurt. Yeah, because leaving a review helps our show get noticed by other people. Like it's a free offering to the algorithm gods who will then hopefully in return highlight our show to other users, right? So when you start playing something, you get that session that says like other suggested shows or recommendations, or if enough people review it high enough, it'll actually end up like on the front page saying, here's things to check out. And we would love for our show to get to more people through any means possible. 
We're normally here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight, the main questions we're looking to answer are what are the best games we played this past year, and what was the biggest gaming surprise of 2021? So as everyone knows, 2021 was um, an unusual year, as, just as the year before. Um, most of the year had everyone staying at home and quarantining and not getting out and playing games and just playing with uh, your, your immediate family or your bubble as, as uh, the term that everyone has come to know now for your private group that you only interact with. Now, by the end of the year, though, things did start opening up. And what I was surprised to see is that a bunch of the big game conventions actually happened. So like PAX U, Gen Con, Origins. Was there an Origins? There was an Origins, was there not? Uh, yeah, I think sure. there was. Yeah. It was just late. I think it was in October. So you had all the big game con conventions did end up happening. And in addition, at least here locally, the local game shops opened up. And some of them, not all of them, started having regular open game nights again. Now that said, we didn't attend any of this. No cons, no public play, no game nights. I did go to the local game store, one of them, my favorite local game store, and check the place out because they moved um, for free RPG day. But I did a little bit of shopping, but I have not actually sat down and gamed with anyone, not at my house or at um, my mother-in-law's house. Due to the fact we've got some high-risk members in our family, just didn't feel that it was responsible for us to do so. And well, it turns out the pandemic isn't actually over, and maybe those cons shouldn't have happened anyways, but hindsight is, of course, 2020, and there were a lot of great games out there, despite some of the bad news in the world over 2021. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to get into if you should or shouldn't have. We didn't, is all that matters at this point. Now, due to this, it was a really odd year gaming-wise for us, especially for discovering new games. Now, yes, here on the show, we do try to keep up with the news and we do try to catch some of the new hotness. And we've even been using our Sunday brunch episodes to look at some of the great games that were released at Essen this year. And yes, I did pick up some games throughout the year, but I didn't get to try nearly as much new stuff as I would in a normal year, even less so than the year before, because at least the last year, up until March, we were out gaming and a lot of games come out at the beginning of the year and I at least got to see and try some of the games. Because the main way I often discover new games is at cons, right? Going and doing demos and paid events and actually playing through games and through local game nights. And while we didn't have either. So due to this, this more so than most of our top lists are not going to be comprehensive. We did not play very many of, of the new hotness or games that were released. This year. So the list we're going to get to later on are games we played. And we didn't, like the best games we played this past year. But no, we did not play all the new games or most of the new games. Or honestly, we played a handful of the games that actually were released this year in 2020. So we are not going to be talking about the best games published in 2021. Though I did make a little short list of the ones I did try. But rather, these are going to be the games we had the most fun playing. Whether they're new to us or old favorites that we're still getting to the table. And indeed, we are just a couple of old cis white guys. And while we do our best to support all the communities, we don't pre present, pretend to represent anything other than what us and what is fun for us. Yes. Now, before we get to the top tens, I thought it'd be fun to share a few stats based on this past year. We usually do this every year just to kind of take a look at it. And I mainly do it for my own sakes. I want to know. So in 2021, based on logging my plays on Board Game Geek, which I try to log everything, both online plays and physical, I played 89 different games. Now, that does count role-playing games as well as board games. I was smart enough to check both lists and merge the two. Um, and that's not counting any expansions. So there are quite a few actual expansions we tried this year for the first time. And I got to say, like, that sounds like 89 different games sounds like a lot, but that is a low number for me anymore. Uh, usually I'm in the hundreds at least, at least different games I've played. Now, what I did do a lot more of is that was over 400 plus different game plays. And of course, a huge part of that is playing online, playing board game arena, because this year, more so than any previous year, I spent way more time playing games online than I have previously for obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, it's been a weird one, that's for sure. <laughs> now, I thought this is always interesting to look at as my most played games of the year. 
Uh, one thing that's funny is Race for the Galaxy is not on there at all because, like, I, I think we overplayed it last year on, on Board Game Arena. We played so many games of Race for the Galaxy. I topped 100 gameplays over all of that game. That one has dropped off the list It'd be just because, and you know what? If Eric started a new game, I'd probably start playing again. But at some point, someone didn't hit rematch and we just stopped playing. Now, what my most played game was Patchwork, which is mostly both Sean's playing with, um, with Sean from Hamilton and Sean Hamilton. Uh, we, I played, we Patchwork came out on Board Game Arena. And when you sit down and play that, it can play ridiculously quick. I honestly think you could probably real time finish a game in like five minutes if not 10. So Patchwork is my number one. Number two is Space Base, which actually surprised me. Like I, I knew it was up there. We played a lot of Space Base, but I didn't think that much. So my second most played game of 2021 is Space Base. My third is Adventuria. And the impress, like I know I've been playing a lot of Adventuria, but what's impressive about that is how long each game is. Like, like Adventuria, sitting down to play Adventuria is an event. Like you got to sort your decks and find your boxes and play your thing. I was surprised it was up there. It's it's in the 20s, so I played lots of Adventuria. Uh, next is Draconius Invasion, which the only reason it's that high is because we had to review the expansion and played 12 games in a row over two days. Um, so that is the main reason. And I'm not trying to bash on the game by saying that. It's just that's why it's up there so high, is we played through a 12-part campaign of that game in addition to just playing the game enough to review it in the first place. So you're looking at 20 plays of Draconis, um, mainly so we can play through a whole campaign. And then the last um, is Codenames Duet, which I, I, that's just such a fantastic game. That, that's a go-to date night game for DNI. Uh, we play it with Corey and Kat. We prove to uh, Sean that it's not just a two-player game. In addition, during our extra live stream, we actually played a ton of Codenames with our chat room and other people joining us at Codenames.com, I think it is. I can't remember the name of the site, yeah. whatever it is, Codenames.com where it's free to play. So those were my top five games played. And yes, you will note that none of those came out in 2021. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been interesting. Physically, I played 23 games. Now, I, I record games differently than Mo. I don't record digital plays, uh, usually not even tabletop simulator plays. Um, but so 23 new games, which really isn't all that low a number for me, all things no. considered. Uh, thankfully I was able to get down to Windsor a couple of times during, uh, some safer periods and that, uh, allowed that there's probably about a dozen new games on board game arena, um, as well as some old favorites on board game arena that have, uh, debuted they, this year. Um, today they actually debuted a new game, a uh, spot it, which is an interesting one. This is their first sort of real time speed game specifically, yeah, specifically designed so that if you are playing on a touch screen, you have an advantage. Interesting. Yeah, Spotted, that's a classic game that's been around for a lot of time that my kids enjoyed. Yep. Um, honestly, all we own is the um, tabletop day. It gave out a free pack, and it was like a mini pack. Right. But it gives you all you need to know about Spotted. My kids liked it, but didn't love it. I always thought it would be a good adult game, but I have other games. Like, I, I could play that or Go Cuckoo, so I tend yeah. to grab Go Cuckoo. But it is a fun game, and I, like except for you're saying there's a new way to play. I'm like, how the heck do you play that on board game arena? Yeah, so they they've I don't know how they've worked out the time. Like, I'm concerned about the timing of actual yeah. loading. Well, but, yeah, uh, like lag, right? If one player is lagging, that game just doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but there's a couple of different play modes. I haven't gone into it, but uh, that is there for fans of that game. I wonder if that'll lead to other games like like say Set or Ratuki, other other real time games. Well, that I mean, it fast. could be they you know it, it, as Moody's got their hands in there and they are pushing out a lot of games that's true almost one a day it is one a day right now isn't it no there's uh are they doing one i don't think they're doing one they were for a while but but they're they're definitely doing one they always do one a week so one a week is is every wednesday is is usually new new game night or day yeah i gotta say 23 new games for you is is actually a pretty high number Mm -hmm. you i to be honest i'd have to go back through previous years to figure out what my real numbers are but it felt low right which reminds I, I, me, actually, speaking of which, sorry, Gaia Project. We need you, you need to teach me so we can play it on BGA. I don't own it. How do I teach you to play? A you game? don't. I don't you own don't it. own Gaia. I thought no, you did. No, I don't own Gaia Project. Well, we'll have to learn that then. Yeah, <laughs> we could learn it. I played it once, but it was someone else's copy who taught me, which I haven't read the rules myself, so I don't know how well that teach was. Right. All right. So. Let's get to the list. All right, so we're going to start with the top 10 list. So these are going to be the top 10 games we played in 2021. 
Um, I did rank them. So these are ranked, unlike our usual list, which aren't in any particular order. We're going to start at 10 and work our way up to one, and we'll take turns. We each do our 10, then our nine, then our eight. Uh, we're not going to do the dice tower thing. This is further up on the other person's list, which there is some overlap, but not a lot. There was more, but then as I refined my list, I, I took some off that we matched because I was like, well, Sean's going to mention that one, and I can at least say I liked it. So I did tweak mine once I saw Sean's list. Now, one of the things I do want to point out, again, just in case you're here to hear about the new hotness from 2021, I stuck to games that were new to me this year. So everything on this list, I had not played until 2021. Ditto. And that said, <laughs> not earned. all of them are games that came out in 2021. These are games I discovered in the last 12 months. Some are rather old. Now, did you do the same? Did you I, stick? I did. These are all new to yeah. me this year. Perfect. Okay. So when we first sat down to make the list, I'm like, I don't know, you can talk about your favorite game even with something old. And I do have one I want to talk about, but I'm going to save that for an honorable mention. So my number 10, and here's where we need to, you know, get someone to record number 10, because that's, that's the <laughs> Dice Tower thing. I don't want to steal the Dice Tower thing, but we need we need our countdown. And if it was a, if it, we weren't so busy, I would have Sean create something that we can flash <laughs> up for top list. I don't know what it'd be. Like a bell that dings 10 times. No, that'd drive everyone nuts. Yes, it would. <laughs> now i'm tempted <laughs> just to, if i have a skip button all right so number 10 is shadow kingdoms of valeria this is the most different valeria game that's out there the the one that is the farthest from hard kingdoms of valeria this is a game where you are playing the bad guys who are attacking valeria and it is a dice based worker placement game but you're not placing the dice. You're placing a worker to collect dice of different colors that you're then going to use. And the dice represent your warriors to do various attacks, various, various conquests. So you're going to sit there and go out and attack different areas of the Valeria landscape using your dice. I possibly shouldn't have put this on the list because I took something else off for the same reason. So I technically played this originally in 2020 because as a prototype, but it wasn't published until this year, and I haven't played now the published copy. Um, one thing I will give Daily Magic Games thumbs up for is the prototype in this are awesome. Like, they're identical. There was no, wow, they need to fix this, need to change this. They sent me a complete game that just wasn't production ready. And now that I had the production copy, it looks amazing. It's the exact same game with better components. So strongly recommend Battle Kingdoms of Valeria. The one thing I haven't done yet is explored the expansion. That's on my, my two playlist is to check out the expansion. So my number 10 for 2021, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. All right. Well, my number 10 is Marvel Strike Teams. Now, this was one that we got uh, on a deal that, uh, you know, I'd never even heard of it. Uh, but it was a, it's a use of hero clicks without being hero clicks. So it's, it's yep. using the click style but for a different purpose. In this case, it's actually the stats as you level up. Uh, it is a uh, PvP uh, plane where you, it's, it's a team of heroes played by one or more players against a uh, the, the GM or villain of the thing with various setups. And it was interesting. It was fun. Uh, my son and I had fun, but not enough fun to actually get it back to the table again yet. Mm. Um, so it was, it was interesting. It was, it was fun. I think it's well done. Uh, but it just didn't capture the imagination as well as we might have hoped it would. So that's why Marvel Strike Teams, while interesting, is still only my number 10. So you said there's a DM. Is it an AI you're playing against cooperatively no, it's, it's or is the one player, player plays? One, so it's a player. One player plays bad guys. One, okay. one or more player plays good guys. All right. So one versus many Marvel Strike Teams. And what I just, I am so confused that they didn't make them hero click. Like, like that's bad. The Star Trek one I get, right? Like Star Trek's so far apart, but these are superheroes and yep. Hero Clicks is superheroes. It seems really strange to have published this game without it being compatible with the rest of the Hero Clicks. So unlike the, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles starter set that came out, which had a fantastic cooperative game included in the box, you can then use those with all the rest of your Hero Clicks. It's one I'm curious about. Um, if we got together more often, I'd say you should bring it down and play it, but we've got lots of other stuff we should probably try first. Absolutely. <laughs> Next, we have number nine. For me, that is the oldest game on this list, I think. I actually didn't compare it to another game that's further down to see, but I think it's the oldest game on this list, and that is Yardmaster. I have to thank Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, for selling me his copy of this game way back 
when he was moving and didn't want to move all his games and needed some extra money. Thankfully, it's now still in our game group, so Sean can keep playing it. Every time I post online that I've been playing it, he's like, oh, I missed that game, and he's glad I got my copy. This is a not a drafting game like Express. It is a train building game where you are adding cars to a growing train by matching the color or the number on the cards with the ability to trade in resources. So resource management, hand management, set collection, race to build freight trains. And that is Yardmaster. My number nine for 2021. All right, well, my number nine is a card game as well, although a very different card game. Uh, I went with Funfair, uh, which I think we all had a lot of fun playing. Uh, it was really good. It just wasn't the part game I wanted. Uh, it was too fun. And, and I guess, you know, again, we've, we've been talking in the Discord about uh, we're playing Park Attack now and we're having great memories, Roller Coaster Tycoon and the other games from that genre in the past. And one of the things that happens in those games is, you know, bad things happen. There, there is some nastiness, even if you're not actively playing against other players, some things happen. And that's just sort of part of life you, as you expect it from a theme park. Mm-hmm. And, and for that matter, it, Funfair just came off as a bit nicer. And, and I'm not an antagonistic gamer. I'm not a player who does a lot of take that games. But Funfair was just too, too nice, I think, for the genre that it's trying to represent. Uh, and it has its place. It's a great game. It's really well made and it's really well balanced. It just didn't quite fulfill the need that I was personally looking for. So Funfair ended up at number nine. Yeah, for me, Funfair, I really dig. I really liked it. I, I think it is a fantastic introduction to that system of games, which uh, you can probably guess we're going to talk about the other game later. <laughs> um, I think it's great for that. It's a great gateway game. It's a great family game. If you want a, a light, fun game about building a theme park for your family get-together or to play with kids, I think it's a great recommendation. Absolutely. Number eight. This actually comes from the same company, so this was unplanned. I have another game from Good Games Publishing, and that is Land versus Sea. Land versus Sea is an abstract tile laying game where you are trying to build either land features or sea features and close them off to score points. At least that's the basic game. And to be honest, the basic game's good. The basic game's solid. It is a great gateway game. It is a great tile laying game, and I think families will love it. Where the game shines, though, is with optional scoring systems, and surprisingly, Playing at three and four players. While the game seems to be built as a two-player game, don't believe that it is. Uh, it, this game, in my opinion, plays better with three and four with some variant rules. Now, I have a lot more to say about Land vs. Sea, and if you stay tuned to the whole episode, you'll get to hear our featured review later, where I will highlight Land vs. Sea, my number eight game of 2021, and actually released in 2021. Well, for me, it's Codenames Duet. Now, this is not a new game at all, but it's new to me, and I finally got to experience that world that is Codenames Duet, the non-two-player game that sounds like it should just be a two-player game. Uh, (laughs) Sorry, I didn't even think about the fact these two are together. That's funny. And uh, we have played this any number of times, especially in the digital version, uh, with our fantastic fans that joined us during our... uh, extra life streams this summer and played uh, with us digitally and got to experience the group play that is Codenames Duet. Yeah, I still stand by the fact that Codenames Duet is the best version of Codenames. I have multiple versions of Codenames that are all mixed together in my Codenames Duet box because that's how I use it all. Codenames Duet, the team-based Codenames, to me is a superior to the original competitive which is also still team-based, but compared the cooperative version versus competitive. And I'm not even a huge co-op fan, so that's that's another one. Deanna also prefers it. Anytime you get Deanna loving a co-op game, it's got to be good. Absolutely. Moving on. <clears throat> Number seven, I have Riff Raff, the most precarious stacking dexterity game I have ever played in my entire life that takes some real skill and planning and strategy to be able to play at all properly. The key to Riff Raff is realizing that getting everything on the ship is not how you win the game, but rather catching the stuff that falls is a bigger part of the game than making sure you stack things correctly. This is a wooden ship on a gimbal with masts, masts 
that wobble. I, I, there is something fantastic about that game. One of the benefits of using this gimbal that I love, though, is it doesn't require a flat table. If your table's off center, the ships will still stay straight upright. A big bonus when playing at some, at least of our local game stores, whose tables have seen better days. I am so glad I bought this one off Jamie. So thank you, Jamie, uh, Wilt Chamberlain, local gamer, for selling me your copy of Riftcraft. Even though way back when we played it, I don't know how many years ago for the first time, I tried your copy. We got so frustrated just trying to assemble the thing we had given up. Yeah, Riffraff's an interesting one. Uh, you aren't going to find it. You aren't going to get it. This is not the new hotness, even yeah. slightly. But if you ever do get a chance to play a copy, it's definitely worth a play. Yeah, this is the one that might be older than the Yardmasters. I'm not <laughs> positive. Uh, for me, the next up was Letter Jam. Uh, this one, uh, newer, it's not new, we, but it wasn't, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to play that when we first reviewed it. So we decided to, you know, get it to the table when I was down at one point early in the year. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a fun. The scoring is a little weird, but the actual game itself is just such in, so, so enjoyable. Uh, it's a really great game. And again, just with most of these letter games, this the style, the scoring is, is always a little on the questionable side. I honestly don't know how uh, party game scoring. Like, like, like I'd, I'd have to talk to like Bruce Vogue or some of the from the party game cast, which is a now pod faded, but an excellent old podcast for party games and people who play them. Um, what what is up with party games with terrible scoring? The letter jam scoring makes less sense than most. I will say, overly complicated and makes very little sense. Um, that was a surprise hit for me. It didn't make my top ten. Um, probably need to play it a few more times, but what I did like about it is I can't think of another cooperative word building game. And maybe they're out there, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. So I liked that because your personal vocabulary didn't matter, right? It was your group team's vocabulary. And honestly, words that you think the other people at the table will know are more important than spelling the longest thing. And I, I really enjoyed that aspect. Of that as well. Yep. No, absolutely. Number six, Roll Camera. Uh, we did a review of this one in this last year. This is another big hit that came out in 2021. So we do have some of those on our list. This is a worker placement game using dice that's different than Shadow Kingdoms because you are actually placing the dice. You are trying to make the best or worst film that's ever been made. Um, you're putting building sets. You're putting actors on the set. You're putting cameras on the set. You're holding meetings. You're trying to plan your budget. You're changing the script halfway through. It's all the chaos of making a movie in board game format. Uh, this one is a was published by Team Bean Publishing, but is being distributed by Grand Gamers Guild. And I think it's awesome that Mark reached out and got us a copy because this I probably would have just skipped right over. And it is a fantastic game. Like this may be a big hidden gem because I don't see anyone else talking about this game and it is really good. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do wish that we had managed to find the physical time for this one. That, that's one I missed out yeah, on. Yeah, you only got to play. That's right. You only physical. played on tabletop simulator. So uh, my number six is Aventuria. Uh, I know we have all talked about this game ad nauseum, I think. I don't know if people are sick of hearing it, but uh, I hope <laughs> not because we've still got a lot of content. Yes. Um, the problem, unfortunately, is only so much of that content is available online for us. So... Yes. While I have taken part both digitally and physically, uh, we, we've, we've well exceeded the, uh, the digital components available to us. So without rehashing old missions and things and redoing things, uh, there's only so much I can do until, we can get, until I can get back down and uh, get to experience some of the content in a physical form. But that being said, all the times physical and digital I have played Aventuria, have really been an enjoyable time. The biggest problem we are having with Aventuria is getting caught. So that is where this game is falling down. I feel guilty with how much we push this game and how awesome it is. And I want to share the love because it's that good, but you can't get it. No one else is getting to experience this like us. I, I would love to be having that shared experience of we've all played this together. Let's sit down and talk about what happened to you during Forest of Notre Dame. 
I can't do that with our fans. That is, that is my biggest disappointment with my Venturia. And I get it, global pandemic, uh, global shipping issues, container shortages, all the things going on in the world right now. I get it. It is coming. Adventuria is coming to North America. Their uh, Kickstarter to be fulfilled, which includes a new printing of the game. It just, it's not here yet. So that is my only complaint about Adventuria at this point, is the fact that we can't share the love of this game with others. Absolutely. Number five. I have unfair. Earlier, Sean was talking about funfair. Unfair is the unfair version of funfair about building theme parks. Sounds strange to talk about it this way because technically unfair came out way before funfair. And the only reason I even tried out unfair was because I got to review funfair and funfair was so good and then I want to try the whole game. I still think for anyone new to the game, you're better off trying funfair. And if you like it, pick up unfair. Uh, this is a theme park building game with all the nastiness Sean missed in the original. Uh, definitely more cutthroat. It's more of a gamer's game. There's extra phases to the game. There's more cards to manage. A fantastic theme park building game. Well, I do have to warn anyone playing, the biggest thing that's important when playing Unfair is knowing the cards. And I strongly recommend, again, start with Funfair just to get the mechanics down. Once you know the mechanics, make sure everyone has a list of all the cards that are in play and has looked through the decks before playing. Because it can be really nasty if you're surprised by things. And the key is to know what can be coming to prepare for it, just in case. I will admit, my first two plays of Unfair, I did not enjoy it at all, but I didn't know the cards. And I wanted to discover it. I just wanted to play. So we just mashed everything together and started playing. And having my park destroyed in the last two turns of the game, which completely made it unwinnable, really stank. Now that I know how the game plays, I know to keep defensive cards. Or I know not to stack all my features on one ride. And so on there's lots of ways to mitigate that nastiness just make sure everyone at the table is aware of how to play it properly but yeah the best in my opinion the best um theme park building game out there and there are a few like this includes the dinosaur park games as well without mentioning them by name yeah it's interesting it's uh, there's definitely a difference in, in most deck building games uh and this isn't technically a deck building game but it, it you know it's it shares some some com but it, again games like this you want to just sort of throw the new stuff in and play and discover as you go uh it's a very common way to do things and mm. that just fails miserably in this game you really do need uh as much knowledge as you can get especially as you start moving into the expansions where yes. things really come out of left uh, you you've you've moved beyond the basic uh concepts of the game into the extra extra stuff and that's where it can really come out of left field and shock you. Yeah, totally. Um, the other thing, too, you want to look at is not just like the type of things that can happen, the card distribution, especially when looking at the blueprints. Knowing that there's only one or two copies of a card can save you from spending an entire game fishing for something that's not there, which can be not. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. And uh, now next up, we have another one. I'm actually sticking to almost newer stuff here. This is my second yeah. 2019 game uh, is Tapestry. From our friends at Stonemeyer Games, uh, this one I I first I got to play digitally. Have I have I played it physically yet? I don't think I have played it physically yet. Yeah, we played five players. Yes, we did. We yeah. played the five player physical. That's right. Where where Cat managed to like fill her entire sideboard somehow. Uh, that's right. Yes, um, I I have played it a lot more digitally, especially now that BGA has a digital version of it. And let me tell you, folks, it's fantastic on BGA, but don't try and learn it on BGA. As with most games, uh, uh, we actually tried learn. We actually learned it on Tabletopia, which was a horrible, dis, painful experience. I'm surprised I learned the game, and surprised I like the game after that experience. But I do. Uh, not only is it a fun game with a whole huge level of variety, but the number, the the replayability, and just the quality of the pieces make it a fantastic physical in-person game and that is tapestry from stonemeyer games the only thing i have to say about that right now is yes it is a civ game there we go number four the quacks of quedlinburg this was a big surprise hit for me i was not expecting this is i don't own a lot like i like heavier strategy games and i like i like medium weight euros up to heavy games and i like having my brain engaged and i like multiple decision points and solving puzzles right like that's generally what brings me to board gaming 
it's not often I find a game that's just fun. Like it's just, it's engaging, it's fun. I'm laughing out loud. I'm cursing when I draw things wrong. There is not a lot of long-term strategy. You can kind of plan ahead and it, it, it's, it's so not my kind of game. But Quacks had me sold after the first play. It is a push your luck, draw things out of a bag game, try to mix your potions and get as thick a potion you can before it explodes. Um, then buy new regions to put in your later potions. There's a great catch-up mechanic with rat tails. This game is, is just way more fun and engaging than I expected it to be. It, it is not a light party game. It's got those Euro elements and that depth and complexity somehow all mixed in the pot so that it just works in this way that is so much fun. Yeah, no, I, my thing about Quacks is it is a friendly game. Yes. It is almost the opposite of a take that for somehow, despite the fact that randomness can mess you up and, and you know, there's all these things and a lot of people have complaints about it for various reasons. But at the end of the day, it is just a friendly game fun game to sit down and play with people and it's one of those games that reminds me of galaxy Traveler, right you're the fun is the journey who cares who wins right watching your ship blow up is just as much fun as pushing it and quacks and drawing that stupid three what are we calling them now i i, I can't even <laughs> snap bombs is the white bird cherry sure, bombs yeah. whatever we're gonna call the white bad resource drawing that three on your last turn and your pot blows up and you throw your bag down is just like sitting there getting hit by a big asteroid down the seven that splits your hat and your ship in half. I, I, I think there's a similar feel that some people are going to hate, but you know what? I love both of those games. The only problem with quacks is the bags and the tokens. Don't yeah, there are, there well. are. It's not a perfect game. Check out our review for full details, but it's still my number four of 2021. And my number four is space base. Just a fantastic game that we've gotten so much play out of, mm -hmm. uh, both physical and digital. Uh, the Tabletop Simulator is a fantastic, if you get the right one, it is the a right. fantastic yes. implementation of it uh, that really sort of helps players along and helps smooth things out and allows you to enjoy the game during this uh, tumultuous time. Um, I haven't gotten into all the expansion into the expansion yet, but uh, as the base game is, I have really just thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, with space base, what we need to do, I, I haven't been feeling very well, obviously, is we still need to go through Shy Pluto on that app because it's there, right? It's and so see if we can play through that so you get to experience it. Uh, space base, like I said it's in my top five played games this year, like it's it's a great discovery you know like why did it take us so long <laughs> it's one of those games like it is not new at all and i'm like wow it took us too long to get to that one. number three for me is earlier on sean's list and that is tapestry from stonemeyer games amazing production really honestly simple rules tapestry's rule book is four pages and it works Literally all you do every turn is I take income and I get a bunch of points and resources or I advance on one of four tracks. Theme comes in when you read what you're doing on those tracks. I realize it's kind of pasted on, but if you actually look, you're developing agriculture and all that, you're getting technologies, you're upgrading technologies, you're building your capital with actual physical buildings that come pre, I should pre-painted is not really the right word because they're the pre-molded plastic that was already colored, but, but like pre-painted miniatures. I have not, had a bad game of tapestry yet i have never cared if i like i care if i win or lose but like i've never been like oh i got last in tapestry or oh i'm terrible at tapestry it's never happened i'm like damn i did last I, either the sieve sucks or i don't know how to play this sieve or like that's the one thing i haven't done that i often want to do is we finish a game and i'm like can we replay with the same sieves so i can try a different strategy the number of civilizations in that game make it infinite replayable um, I know a lot of people out there hate on it, but I am a tapestry fanboy. That one has totally won me over. I, what I need to do next is there's now two expansions for that game, even though I feel like I haven't really discovered everything in the original. Absolutely. Now, next up for me, uh, since I already talked about tapestry, I'm going into my favorite genre, which is 
or while staying there, I guess, because Space Base was last, yeah. but staying in, the, in there is Eclipse, Second Dawn for the Galaxy. Again, this is almost newness. This is 2020 yep. uh, publish, uh, even though the original game is yeah, I, a 2009 uh, game. And this one technically didn't hit retail stores till this year. So it may count. It, it might <laughs> count as a 2021. The only people who were playing in 2020 kickstarted it. There you go. So this, and, and I mean, I, I have I have spoken at length about my love for these the sci-fi games and the big sci-fi games like this one really hit the spot for me. And the the Eclipse Second Dawn Kickstarter, just the components and the the way of storing things has just gone to the next level to make this game so much easier to play because of the setup and play components that it really is just not only a good game but it's a good game that's easier to get to the table now. And that is always a win. So two reasons this isn't on my list. One, I got my copy in 2020. 2020. Um, but second is I've only played twice and I've only played with three players. And I really feel before I can give this a final verdict, I need to get a big six player game in, or at least a four player. But I'm thinking a six player game of Second Dawn. I love the original. Everything they have done to streamline the game is better. Uh, the new features are better. Like it, it, it's Eclipse Plus. And that's like, even if you threw out all the components and gave me the original components of the game, I would be happy. My only complaint about it is I actually don't like the new dice with the blips on them because the hits are only on the six, which is kind of weird. But other than that, I, Eclipse Second Dawn is the, the go to version of Eclipse and one of the best 4X games out there. I have been and always, I think, will be more of a fan of Eclipse than Twilight Imperium. There we go. Big number words. two, number two is where I put Space Base because I, it's my second most played game this year. Like, that's ridiculous. I have played so much Space Base and introducing it to new people. I love the fact that something happens on everyone's turn. Like, the it, it's it's the Machi Koro, the Valeria, the, all of those, except they, I really care what happens on other players' turns. I love the combos. When you get one of those combos where if I roll five to eight, I get these seven things. It's so rewarding um the the various strategies we've seen people go for colonies we've seen people go for sevens we've seen people try to get the stupid card where you win the game if you get enough hangs on it the only complaint i have about space base is one card and yes i finally got there all you people who mocked me earlier who said this was the case there is one card that hurts other players that removes points from players that just makes the game longer and no one who has gotten this card has ever won with it. It just makes the game longer than it needs to be. And that is the, I, I forget the name of it, but it's the card that strips points from other players. Toss that out. Don't play with that. Other than that, Space Base, fantastic. Uh, got a full review on the blog. Also, Shy Pluto, we really enjoyed. So Shy Pluto, I do have a caveat on. You'll have to read the review to find out what I have a problem with on that one. Absolutely. And I've already said my love for Space Base. So uh, moving on, I'm going to now share my love or unfair, which was, again, we've already talked about earlier on the list. Uh, it just hit a little higher for me. Uh, now, part of that could be I haven't played all the expansions as fully as you have. And I know some of your problems came from certain of the newest expansion pack, uh, which I haven't gotten to the table yet. So, But barring that, what I have played so far and the, the three-player and two-player games I've played have been fantastic. And again, this is a rare take that game that I really like. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's that's what helped push this up on my uh, list higher because, again, it's it's not a style or theme of game that I go for. But it was hitting a lot of those Roller Coaster Tycoon type vibes for me and, and just, it felt right. Uh, and that is unfair. It was funny. One of the comments I almost put in the notes earlier today, but I didn't. And I, I don't know if I should have, but I can save it for now. Is we got a comment on the one YouTube video, and it's a review of Unfair, and it's Tron plays Unfair, eats Funfair. <laughs> and I was, I was amused by that. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Because Tron <laughs> really liked Funfair. I like, did. He, he's it like, yeah, good. Funfair is this. But like when he played it before playing Unfair, he was like, this is one of the best games you own. This is a fantastic game. I really dig this. Like he really liked Funfair. But then he played Unfair, and he's like, I never played play Funfair. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> throw that game out. Yeah, absolutely. It's true. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> so that was funny. So yeah, unfair on both our lists. That that's that's possibly between the two of us, one of our strongest recommendations. 
All right, my number one. This is where you insert the drum roll uh, sound that I know you found. <laughs> uh, for me, that's Adventuria, the Adventuria adventure card game from Ulysses Spiel, an adventure card. Excuse me, an adventure card game set in the world of the Dark Eye, Das Schwarzog, from Germany. The the most popular role playing game in 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 um, in Germany converted to card game format, including all of the classic adventures that you can now play through in this card game. There are some things that are just unperfect in this game, in my opinion. Now, the game does include a dual mode where it's like playing magic. That wasn't for me. I'm sure there's people out there that like it, but the real highlight of that game is the cooperative adventure mode where you pick one of the adventures you own, you pick one of four difficulty levels, you pick a hero and you play through an adventure, which involves playing through a linear storyline where you're going to make a couple skill checks and then have some type of boss fight, we'll call it, because they're not always fights. And your skill checks are going to impact that boss fight, either giving you bonuses or penalties. What has really blown me away about this game is two things. One, the difficult decision of what of your cards to turn to endurance. So the mana system in an adventure is just fantastic. It, it adds this, this complexity to the game and this difficulty that I really enjoy of... You have to toss cards out of your deck to be able to do anything with the rest of your cards. You are every turn are going to pick up the two cards, basically removed from the game to be able to use your rest of your stuff. And man, if you built your deck, everything you put in there is for a reason, right? So it's, I love that difficult decision. And I am blown away by the variety in the quests, especially those boss fights, the, the main part of the game where you're doing the big end of the adventure fight, how different everyone has been. From swinging from chandeliers to stabbing werewolves with silver cutlery to trying to escape a flooded room. And it all uses the same mechanics and somehow works to tell different stories every time. Honestly, this is the game has blown me away. It is such a great game. Yeah. And I mean, the, again, I said before, the only reason this isn't higher on my list is because I have, because of pandemic reasons, haven't been able to experience all of the content we've gotten. I've seen it unboxed but I haven't actually gotten to play with it. And that's been, that's what's kept it from being my absolute favorite is because it's just not, I haven't done it. Yeah, you haven't played it. <laughs> well, you've only ever played anything in the base box, right? You haven't even seen Forest. When you played- Yeah, no, we did play Forest. One of them. Yeah, yeah. We, we did played... part one of Forest. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but again, we haven't, haven't done all that much of it. Yeah. Uh, and then, so for me <laughs> is uh, my number one game, and this one is going to sound a little amusing to some people, but it's Draconis <laughs> Invasion. Now, for one thing, I love deck builders. Deck mm -hmm. builders are my thing. That's, you know, me and my family all love deck builders. But the thing about Draconis Invasion is it, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't by any means perfect. But it kept us wanting to play more. You know, we talked about how, yes, we played this because we needed to get the review done and we wanted to get through the whole campaign to make sure we reviewed it properly. But we played it more than we needed to. Like that, especially yeah. in the first box, before we got to the expansion, we kept playing this game more than we had to. We only needed to play a few games and we kept going back to it and we kept wanting to try more and we were frustrated at some of the failures of the game. And I think that's a fantastic sign. If you're invested enough in a game to see a problem and get angry that they didn't do it better because you wanted the game to be better, that's a good thing. I, I did dig this one. It, it was a surprise how good it is. They did some things very right, but the game does have some problems. Uh, that that sums it up well. Uh, there were definitely some things I would wish were fixed, but yeah, like Sean said, it was it was like, why do I keep wanting to play this? But I do. So they did something right. There was a there was secret ingredients. There was something you know stirred in the pot. Something done right. The, the, there was something added to it, right? The, there's a reason I keep buying Tim Hortons coffees on my way to work, even though I'm like, man, Tim Hortons is not the best coffee. Yep. The Draconis is the Tim Hortons of deck builders. It's like you, you just keep going back to it, even though it has some flaws and definitely isn't the best, best yep. deck builder. Absolutely. But I'll admit, I considered putting it on my list. I I, I considered it, but I didn't. I, it, the other games I thought were better. If I was doing a top 20, top 25, it'd probably be one. Yep. All right, so I do also have one honorable mention. So that is the fact that this year, for some reason, well, I kind of know the reason, but we rediscovered Castles of Burgundy. Uh, this is a classic Steffenfeld game. 
Many people claim it is the best Steffenfeld game. I'm still, uh, maybe. Um, I've owned this since the original Aaliyah printing. I don't know what year it came out, but I bought it the year it came out. Um, and we never played it. Like, I have had this forever. People say it's the best two-player game on the market. Deanna and I have date nights, and we never play it. And that's because it's fiddly. It's all kinds of thin cardboard hexes that have to be sorted in by color. Some are all the same. All the greens are the same. All the browns are the same or whatever. But then other ones have to be randomized. And then you got to go through and find the ones with black dots on them because they go in a different place on the board. And then every round you lay out, and it's like 25 of them or something like that. Well, it's more because of the middle. You got six different spots with fours. I don't know, like 30 tiles you got to go lay out. All randomized. And at the end of the round, you got to clear them out. It's just so fiddly. Like setting up the tiles for each round of this game takes longer than it does to play the game. What changed all this? Board Game Arena launched a fantastic adaptation of the game. And if it wasn't for that, I'd probably still have it downstairs and people say, what do you think of Castles of Burgundy? I'm like, oh, it's great, but it's fiddly. Being able to play it without all that setup and fiddliness and sorting. And the worst part is like I baggied everything, so it's easier. But then people put it away wrong because they see a farm and it's got they missed that it's got a black dot so it ends up in the bag i i this honestly has bumped it up that it, it amerigo i always say is my favorite feld trajan's up there this may actually be the best feld once you strip out all that fiddliness right especially when playing with experienced players now that we we currently have a four player game going and everyone now understands all the scoring opportunities <laughs> i think it's how i'll word it it has become really tight. Like our scores are neck and neck. And it's like, oh, you got that stupid thing just before I did and hate drafting. And oh, it it, it has gotten to almost like it feels like a chest like at this point where you're like, oh, I think you're going to do this, then this. So I'm going to do this to disrupt that. Meanwhile, there's two other players I'm not worrying about who are probably kicking my ass because I'm so focused on this one thing. I, I am really enjoying like that, that. That is in a way one of the biggest hits of the year is a game I've owned for years. Yeah, and indeed, while my first couple of games were rough because I decided to go in raw and not do any rule watching or anything. <laughs> I'd never been taught the game. I just sat down and started playing. Uh, and Dee's pointing out in the chat room that the tool tips in that game are yes. really a huge benefit of the implementation because a lot of the graphics are a little on the similar side. So the fact that you can mouse over and see what it is you're mm -hmm. getting, that's a huge benefit. Uh, even but, without that, even if the buildings look distinct, remembering what each building yeah. does was terrible in that game. And so that what, was a game I had to have the reference heat up and passing it around con constantly. So now we've always said that learning games on BGA is a problem. And yeah. it, I, I proved that. <laughs> it, definitely, it definitely took me a couple of times, but uh, some offline chatter with Mo and things mm -hmm. and, and realizing what things people were, other people were doing finally got it into me and I've hit my stride. We're, I'm, I'm keeping pace in the group games. I even got a real time game in with one of our Patreon patrons and their partner nice. one night. Uh, they, they saw me online and, and hit me up and we jumped in and, and played through a game. Uh, and I was right there with them. So that was, uh, that was fun to know. And fun to do. Yeah. This is one where I actually did break out my physical copy and played with Deanna because Deanna was having a real hard time. Like she's reading the rules online and playing on board game arena. And she's like, I just don't get it. Like it's just not clicking. So we, yeah. we have brought out our physical copy brought it over to the in-laws like like I, my physical copy got played because board game arena exists so i gotta thank board game arena and even for that for getting an old game on my shelf played again that's what i and need honestly to do. i want to bring it out to public play like i want, I want to go to the cg realm and play battles of battles in the wrong name uh, the castles of burgundy with four players like in person right there i think that's what i need with zulkin because i am clearly not getting it <laughs> in zulkin <laughs> I haven't been watching. I just, I, I know I lost by two points because I missed that it was last. I round lost by game. 25. So, uh... yeah. <laughs> so I realize, I, I don't know if you're still around, if you care about this, but a lot of people, when they hear best of 2021, want to hear about games that were released in 2021, right? Most people want to hear about the hotness. What was the best games that came out this year? Games released 2021. So looking at both our lists, there really aren't a lot of these, obviously. And we kind of explained why already. So I did have Shadow Kings of Valeria, Roll Camera, and Land vs. Sea on my list. But that's late between the both of us for 2021 games. So as usual, we're not about the new hotness here, but I do want to give a short list of other great games that I played this year that were published this year. 
these are our, our endorsements. These are recommendations. These are games that I thought were really solid, but not good enough to make my top 10 when compared to older games that I tried for the first time this year. And you're mashing all the games together. You can't fit them all. So number one is the Red Bernus Algeria 1857. So I am not sure if this belongs on this list or if it belongs in next year's list because it's not actually being published till 2022. Uh, I played a prototype of this game. This is a great combo of deck building and cubes on a map wargaming that I think both deck builders and wargamers are going to dig. It's a historically accurate game that addresses in a very interesting period of time that I think is worth checking out. Next, I've got the new editions of Galaxy Trucker and World's Fair 1893. So these are reprintings of old games that have been tweaked. I don't think these are the best choices for games that already own the originals. There is not enough difference from the original printings to the new, I think, to justify purchasing the new versions. But if you don't already own Galaxy Trucker or already own World's Fair, now is the time to get them. Not only have they improved the game slightly and done a few tweaks, they're also cheaper than they used to be which is not something you can say often about games. So those two releases I do strongly recommend. Next is a little wordy, which was a surprise hit for me because it's from Exploding Kittens, which is usually silly push your luck party games. This is a very solid two-player word-based game. And finally, I have Gorinto. This would have been on my list, but again, I played the prototype back in 2020, so I wasn't sure if I should put it on, which is the same reason I probably shouldn't have put on Shadow Kingdoms. So since I put Shadow Kingdoms, I probably should have put Gorinto on. But Gorinto is now getting out to backers in 2021. This is an amazing abstract strategy game that I like to joke is the Azul Killer. Because I really do think if enough people play this game, it could be as busy, as popular as Azul. You are drafting tiles to put them onto your own personal player board. The more of each tile you have, the more tiles you can draft. And you're doing variable endgame scoring. So what you're looking for one game changes the other like each time and what i really recommend is i think the base gameplay should be the one where you put out four different cards and they cycle every round so you can plan ahead that adds a level of strategy that i think was missing in the base game. fair enough i think you know world camera was one of those uh tabletop simulator plays which was fun but just never quite as much fun i think if i had gotten to physically play it when i was down yeah. it probably would have hit my top 10 totally fair so the last thing I want to talk about today is what our biggest board game surprise was. So what was the game that surprised you in 2021? You know, I would have to say it's a toss up between Aventuria and Draconis, but I think I'm going to give it to Draconis uh, because we knew from the sheer volume of Aventuria, <laughs> you're going to be getting a bang for your buck, even if it's not the most fantastic game, which it turns out it probably <laughs> is a, a, a fantastic game uh, with so much content there's a whole lot to work with. Whereas mm -hmm. Draconis, we had no idea what no. to expect. We knew we were getting a deck builder. That's kind of it. Uh, it could have been completely forgettable. And yet, while, again, while it had its problems, it shocked us as it kept us wanting to play more. And, you know, yeah. as D was, D was blown away that this was my number one. <laughs> and, uh, and again, it shocked me too. Yeah. Oh, fair. I think I already talked about it enough. Um, if I if I planned this better, maybe I would have picked another game, but it's just how much we love Adventuria, how much we have been enjoying that, and how much other people have enjoyed it. How much, like, Tori now. Every time I'm like, oh, we're getting together Friday? He's like, yeah, can we play Adventuria? So, so he is totally smitten with the game. I know Kat's been enjoying it. It has been a great date night game for Deanna and I to play, and it works as a co-op, because some cooperative games are not good date night games, because you end up frustrated with the other player playing incorrectly or whatever. Aventurius like eliminates all that um, quarterbacking because they get a deck of 30 cards. I don't know what's in their hand. I can't tell them how to play their cards. Maybe I can make some suggestions like attack with this weapon first, but it has been a great cooperative experience. The stories are engaging. And as I mentioned, the, what they have done to keep the game fresh with the same base of core mechanics. It's not like every boss fight has a new set of rules. Like, oh, in this, we're going to break the rules and do this. Like, no, it's just the, the the combination of henchmen and story cards. And yes, some of the expansions added new things like in environments. But the way that game has been kept fresh from the expansions is blowing me away. And the fights are engaging enough that I want to play them again. I do want to go back and try a game on higher difficulties to see if we would have succeeded. I, I want to see how things could play out different. What if the different henchmen come up? Like, And the fact that every time I add an expansion to the game, it adds content to the entire game. 
So when I pick up Forest of Lost Souls, not only do I get to play Forest of Lost Souls, I get a bunch of henchmen that go into my deck and a new hero to play. So now I could go back and play through Master Taylor's Poltergeist, say, with a totally different henchman deck. Or Well, Master Taylor's Poltergeist is a bad example. You have the set deck of eight cards. But I could go back to, um, oh, I'm totally forgetting the name of all the adventures in the base book, the one where you're trying to guess the goblin's name, and I could play through that with a new hero, which would make it feel unique. Uh, that game really has blown me away. And I am so sorry, I can't give you a link to go purchase it anywhere in North America right now. Uh, the last place we saw that had copies was in uh, Noble Knight Games, was the last place I've been able to find it. Now we are here to answer your Gaming and Game Night question. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to a review of Land vs. Sea, a abstract strategy tile laying game from Good Games Publishing, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this game. Land vs. Sea was designed by Jean Paul Jacques, who also did the artwork. Plays two to four players, with games taking under an hour, even at the highest player count. Land vs. Sea was published by Good Games Publishing in 2021 and has an MSRP of $30 US. This is a fun tile layer that some people might consider a next level Carcassonne. Or even a before Carcassonne, because at the basic game, I think it's even simpler. Now in Land vs. Sea, players score by placing hexagonal tiles, trying to complete land or sea masses, with bonus points awarded for X's on the tiles, with a couple special features that let you take extra turns or steal tiles. Now, in addition to this basic game, there's also optional scoring systems, including trying to create chains of coral or mountains, waypoints, and connecting caravans and ships to make trade routes. At three players, the game adds in a new role, the cartographer, which changes up the scoring rules. And at four player, the game becomes a team-based game, with two players playing land and two playing sea. For a look at the excellent components that come in this tile laying game, check out our Land vs. Sea unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Land vs. Sea comes in a rather small box with a succinct and well written rulebook. The box has an insert that also serves as the scoring track with a small trough holding 60 double sided map tiles. There's also a small baggie of wooden markers three for land, three for sea, and one for the photographer. There's nothing to punch out in this game. Similar to Funfair and Unfair, also from Good Games Publishing, everything comes pre-punched. All right, pretty straightforward. Well, what are we doing with these tiles and tokens? So you start by placing the tile that's half land and sea in the center of the table. You're going to pull the Volcano Whirlpool tile, put it off to the side, shuffle the rest of the tiles, and split them into two full stacks. Randomize who's playing land and who's playing sea. Easy to do with those tokens. Now you're going to start by drafting tiles at the top of the, the two piles until both players have two face-up tiles in front of them. No players are allowed to look at both sides of their own tiles, but can't see the flip side of your opponent's tiles or the tiles in the two stacks you're drafting from. Now the game starts with land, and they're going to place a tile, followed by C placing a tile, and continue back and forth until all tiles are in play. Now after placing a tile, so you're going to refill your hand so you always have two tiles face-up in front of you. Now, tiles are placed so the sides match, right? Makes sense. You're going to match land to land, sea to sea. These are six-sided hexagonal tiles. Now, when placing, what you're trying to do is complete areas. So if you're the land player, you're trying to complete land areas. If you're the sea player, you're trying to complete sea areas. By me, complete, I mean they're closed off on all sides. Now, these completed features score one point per tile with bonuses for any X marks or plus marks. I'm not sure which they're supposed to be. It looks like they're pluses in the rule book. They always look like Xs. Note. C can complete land areas and vice versa, but the points only go to the player that controls the area. So closed C areas always go to C, and closed land areas always give points to land. So while you can complete of other opponent's areas, there are only a very few instances where you'd want to, usually after you've calculated some sort of trade-off in the points. Mm -hmm. For most players, you'll only be completing your own area until you're a lot more experienced. Yeah, sometimes it's worth closing off an area just so your opponent doesn't make it bigger. But you are just giving them points. Now, in the basic game, some tiles feature special symbols. There's two of them. One of them lets you place your second tile, which can lead to more scoring. And the other lets you steal a tile from another player. Now, once the last tile is placed, the game is over. Player with most points wins. Now, there is one extra special rule with the Volcano Whirlpool. So if a player ever creates a ring of tiles that creates a hole in the map where all six edges of that ring 
are the same type. So all sea or all land. You then get to, for free, place the volcano or whirlpool tile. Now, this is a tile that contains a lot of X's on it. So it's worth a lot of points for whoever closes off that area. But no, there's only one of those doing double duty. So first come, first serve, which can hurt you if you've both been working on a six-sided area. There's only one person who's going to score it. And honestly, that's it. That's the basic rules for land versus sea. Now, along with these basic rules, the game also comes with a number of optional scoring rules that you can mix and match to add to your game once you've figured out the basics. You'll want to play the basic two-player game a couple of times first just to get the ideas and fiddly bits under your belt before moving on to three-player, four-player, or advanced scoring rules. Correct. And some of these advanced scoring rules are required, actually, if you play three or four. You definitely want to get them down while playing two. So one of the optional scoring rules is Coral Coral and Mountle. Uh, one of these bonus scoring versions is coral and mountain scoring. Coral scores points for seas, mountain score points for land, and you get these points for making chains of the appropriate feature. You're going to get two points per tile in the chain after the first one. These make a huge deal in the scoring, but can also distract you from other scoring formations, as you often need to decide which use of a tile will give you the bigger score in the long run. Now, caravan and ship scoring adds an area control aspect to end end game scoring. A player scores two points when they place a caravan or ship next to another tile with a caravan or ship on it. And at the end of the game, you're going to look at each grouping of caravans and ships touching each other, count how many of each type of the tile you find. If there's more caravans, land scores one point per tile in the trade route. If there are more ships, then C scores the points in the trade route. If there's a tie, no one gets any points. Now, these are fiddly and you need to pay close attention, in part because some of the confusing other graphics on the tile that aren't ships or caravans. And we'll get more into that when I get to my full thoughts on the game. Finally, we have waypoint scoring. Uh, each player gets a waypoint token at the start of the game and can place it on an incomplete feature at the end of their turn. Whenever this feature is completed or the tile containing a counter is surrounded on all six sides, the player that owns it gets it back and scores one point. Remember to try, try remembering to put it back out when you collected it is one of those things that you really need to try and remember mm -hmm. to maximize your scoring potentials. Now, as mentioned earlier, all of these optional scoring systems can be mixed and matched. You could use one, two, three, all of them, none of them. Now, all the rules I just mentioned are for playing for two player only. Land versus sea can also be played and works equally well with three or four players. But there are rule changes for each player count. No, these are official variants right in the rule. They're, they're, they're part of the game. With three players, you add a cartographer. So you have land, sea, and the cartographer. This player drafts and plays tiles the same way as other players, taking their turn after sea. So it's land, sea, cartographer. They Land and sea and X's all work the same as in the basic rule. What changes is corals and mountains. They now score points for the cartographer and the cartographer only. And at the end of the game, where you're working out those trade routes, a tie, no longer are the points left, they go to the they go to the cartographer instead of being lost. So note, you do have to use those optional rules when playing with the cartographer, and it's also recommended you also use waypoint. You know what? It's very interesting twist to the game that, frankly, was much more engaging than I had expected based on just that little description above, basically. Uh, but again, it's not something you want to jump into without learning those basics first in the two-player game. Yeah, you don't want your first player cartographer, or sorry, land versus sea being playing the cartographer if you've never played before, I don't think. Now, the standard four-player game of land versus sea is played in teams. All the basic rules apply, including the fact you can't show anyone the back of your tiles. That includes your partner. In addition, you also can't talk to the other player about where they're playing, what they should play, excuse me, where they're playing, what they should play, or what side of the tiles to use. Now, what you can do, though, is you use waypoints. When you're using waypoints when playing four players, it's strongly recommended to use them because these become the main way to communicate with your teammate. Either you're telling them you want them to play in a spot or like, hey, look, look at my tiles and look at where I'm putting this because you can see I can complete this, right? Like that is your main way of communicating. Now, with four players, the score for each team is shared, and the winner is the team with the most points, either land or sea. Well, now that we've got a good idea of how to play, how about you share your thoughts on land versus sea?
So I have to start by saying I am a Good Games Publishing fanboy. I'll go out and say it that far. Um, we have reviewed a number of their games, and none of them have been a flop. And like all other Good Games Publishing games we played, Land vs. Sea features excellent component quality, clear and concise rules, easy to learn rules, and I would say this is actually the easiest game by um, Good Games Publishing to learn, and features engaging and variable gameplay that has me coming back time and time again, always interested to play again. This is one of those games where I finish a game and I'm like, want to go again? And while it's not the same experience, they always also make tabletop simulator versions of their games, which are solid first-party implementations yes. that can give you a good experience, if not quite the same one as a physical one. And for anyone who does want to try this game, it is free on Tabletop Simulator, as long as you've got a copy of that, and it is a good implementation. And they even went so far as to link a, um, a Rodney Smith Watch It Played video right on the table, so you can even learn how to play the game while you're in Tabletop Simulator. Now, they claim that you can teach Land vs. Sea in two minutes. And I got to say, I was skeptical at first, but I think it takes about that much time. Like, honestly, this is how you teach games. You're going to play a tile. If you complete land versus sea area, the respected player gets points. Then you're going to get bonus points for these little X's. Then you're going to draw new tiles. In addition, there's two special symbols to watch for. This one gives you an extra turn, and this one lets you steal a tile. That's it. That's pretty much all you need to know how to play. Now, I'm talking, so I couldn't show you those tiles, but if I had them in my hands, that's all you really need to start playing. Now, normally, I, don't, I say don't try and teach games on Tabletop Simulator, but in this case, it really isn't even hard to teach digitally. Oh, honestly, this one works pretty good. Now, at the basic game play level, Land vs. Sea is honestly, in my opinion, the most accessible tile laying out game out there. Compare it to other popular tile laying games, I think this is a better gateway game for either new hobby gamers or non-gamers. It's great for playing with your extended family and with kids. That basic game is just nice and tight. It's one of those games, too, where you have that emergent gameplay. Stuff you don't notice the first couple of plays, but that start to sink in as you start to master the game. Things like the timing of using those bonus actions and stealing tiles. When you should steal a tile. What tiles you should steal. When it's worth taking two actions in a row and using the bonus. When it's not important and you can draft another tile instead. Hate drafting, which is sneaking tiles only because you don't want your opponent to have them. Also, just getting to know the tiles and the distribution. How many tiles are in the entire pile that have five land and one sea on them, for example? Learning to look at the face-up tiles in front of you and your opponent and the face-up tiles on the drafting pile to plan your moves and also to try to predict what your opponent's doing. All of that is stuff that adds depth to this game that may not be obvious at first glance and first play. I got to say, with two experienced players, a two-player basic game of land versus sea starts to have that chess-like feel where you're actually out maneuvering and out playing and out planning your opponent. Absolutely. There's, there's so much strategy, even with that basic game, uh, before you add any of the additional aspects in. Uh, and in fact, almost uh, specifically before you add the additional yes. aspects in, which can distract you from some of that, uh, that shape making and, and it really so many ways to try and encourage someone to oh you know what i'm i see they've got that piece over there i'm going to put a piece here that's going to encourage them to expand that so that i can fill this in steal a piece right. and you know and, and and fill in this much gianter thing while leaving them <laughs> exposed it's it, exactly. there's so many great options there now while the two-player basic version land versus he is good to me, the game starts to become great once you add in those options. Now, of all the bonus scoring systems, the cor Coral, I don't know why I keep wanting to say Coral, the Coral and Mountain scoring is my favorite to use. And honestly, I want to use that in every game. I really enjoy that added aspect of making chains, not just completing areas. One of the best things this does is also adds in an incentive to help your opponent out while trying to help yourself more. So it may be worth you putting down that additional mountain to score that, even though you might be closing off a C area or the opposite. And the game's no longer just about closing, right? And stopping your opponent from closing. There's a whole other aspect to look for. And you can score a lot of points with those reefs and ranges. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, and again, though, it, it really does change up things because you're, you have to balance that. Do I want the points now for the 
coral or do I maybe want to leave this open so that I can close in a bigger spot with more action later? You, those decisions come up and, and you never honestly never know because you know, there, you don't know what tiles are coming up to who. Yep. Now that is followed by the waypoint rules for me. Um, well, one point here and there doesn't feel like much. And every time I explain the waypoint rules, they're like, what, you get one point for completing it? While playing, by the end of the game, those waypoint points can really add up. And have actually, in fact, been a difference between a win and a loss in a couple of games I've played. That, like, you know, it's within six points, and, well, you only earned eight points for waypoints, and that made the difference. The only issue I've seen with waypoints, what Sean mentioned earlier, is that new players especially, and even experienced players, tend to forget to put them out. Yeah, there, there's a number of times where we've seen uh, seen them used, and it's it's they've been sitting on the table, and you you... As a good player, you want to remind someone, hey, did you remember to put that out? But also, as the person who wants to win, you don't want to remind yes. them to put that out, uh, even though you really know that they should always be out on the mat. You never yeah. want to keep they it on really the table. Should. They really should. Now, of the optional scoring rules, trade routes is my least favorite. Um, but that's not to say they're bad or that I don't like the way they work. It's just of the three, I've ranked this third. I do love the added level of complexity and decision points added by trade routes. Like I like area majority. I like that style of scoring. And I love to use them if I want to sit down to a competitive game, a game where I'm trying to outplay my opponent. I want to see who's the better player. The reason I don't use them every time, though, is they add a level of fiddliness to what's otherwise a very elegant game. Sadly, the caravan and ship features don't stand out well as the others in the game, and they can be difficult to spot on a growing map. In addition to spotting them, you also have to keep track of them and count them, right? So you're counting the different features and see, do are there more caravans or are there more ships? And then when there end up being multiple trade routes on different areas of the board, that can be a lot to keep track of. Is that one tied? Wait, that one's three, that one's this. And I find it adds a lot of AP to the game and a lot more staring at the board before making your play. And then again, this comes up at the end of the game because finding all the trade routes and scoring them is just fiddly compared to I look at the score track and see who won. Now, I admit we did hack our game and we now use wooden cubes that I happen to own from other games to mark out them, to make the scoring easier. But what I find is once you throw trade routes in, it's a much more serious, fiddly game that takes longer. So if I'm looking to just have a fun experience, hey, let's play a game together, chat and hang out, I'm not going to throw the caravans. Yeah, I have to say, when I was learning this, even though we were learning on Tabletop Simulator, I was glad that the only time we put the caravan scores in was when I was playing the cartographer I didn't have to worry about them except for ties at the end. Uh, it was it was nice to not have to to deal with that level of fiddliness because once you get say four trade routes out on the map, you're just spending a lot of time looking at trade routes and and thinking about okay, I've got a trade route on this on this uh, tile. Do I want to go here or here or where, where is it gonna you know where's the balance already shifted one way or the other? It, there's a lot of of extra effort and and potential AP involved. And what's what's better? Do is it is it better to clean this trade row at the end of the game or close off this area that's going to score me ten points now? Is that trade row going to grow? It just, excuse me, it's just an extra level of complexity. Yep. Now all of these different scoring systems do interact very well together, and I got to say they're fun to use in all the possible combinations. Like there's nothing to stop you to play a two player game of trade routes and no reefs, or you can play a game with uh, waypoints but nothing else. And I do like that, and I do love that all of these add a level of depth and complexity to the game that then moves it beyond a gateway game. And one of the things I like about this game, and like I'm obviously not in this place, but if I had a new gamer and I gifted them a copy of Land vs. C, it's the kind of game that can kind of grow with them, right? They're like, I'm a gateway gamer. I just want to put tiles down and make, make patterns. Great. But then once they're like, oh, you know what? I played this other game that has this area control. Well, now I can add that to my Land vs. C. And as you learn more hobby gaming mechanics, you can evolve your game of Land vs. C to match that complexity level, which I just think is a really neat aspect of the game. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I would be worried that uh, people would be tempted to feel like they aren't playing the full game without adding all the other things in and would be in a bit of a rush to add all those other sections in. But if, they can, if you can understand that the game is just as real with just mm -hmm. this and you can completely ignore all that other stuff uh, until you're ready for it, until everyone at the table feels they're ready for it and you're still playing the full game. Yeah, these are all valid ways to play. It's not that this is an incomplete game without playing with three players or without playing with waypoints. 
Now, the biggest surprise to me, though, when discovering Land vs. Sea is just how well it works with more than two players. The three-player Land vs. Sea is even more cutthroat than the core game. It's also more engaging to me because there's more to watch for. You're, you're not only worried, if you're land, you can't just focus on completing land, right? It's really easy to just focus on land, but you're going to probably be missing the fact that you're helping out the other players that you're putting down mountains that the cartographer can use. And like, it's easy enough to keep track of two players. Once you have that third player in, it's definitely more interesting. And then trade routes become even more important than ever. And a handful of waypoints can mean the difference between winning and losing. The only problem I've actually had playing with three players is that you're playing it. If you're playing with people who are used to playing two player, who are used to land and sea and using the corals, uh, the coral in the mountains, they're going to forget that the coral and mountains are now just for the cartographer. And I've played games where I've had to remember, they put a tile out and I'm like, wait, remember, you're not going to get those mountain points. You're giving it to the other player. And that can be a difficult transition to someone who has played the base game many times. Fair. Absolutely fair. Now, my favorite way to play land versus sea is actually four players, which is a shock to me. Is a big shock to me because for one, I don't usually like team-based games, especially team-based abstract strategy games. I don't know exactly what it is about Land vs. Sea, but it does something different enough from other games that I end up loving it. Now, the real highlight here to me is those communication restrictions. This leads to wonderful moments in game, both moments when you use a waypoint to communicate something and your partner gets it instantly and puts the right tile down and then you put the thing down and you get a huge bonus together. And... When things go totally wrong, when you put your thing down because you're trying to say, I want to close that off next turn, and they put something on that expands it out, you're like, oh, why did you play that? Both of those, to me, are wonderful moments to have come up in a game. The lack of communication is also great for a social game night hanging out with friends because you can't really talk about the game, so it opens up the table for all kinds of friendly conversations about how far you got in Breath of the Wild or the latest movie that just came out. Exactly. You don't have to stop all those other conversations that sometimes during a board game people find annoying it's like oh stop talking about what you're watching on tv we want to focus on the game well you have to focus on the game without talking so might as well talk about what you watched on tv last night exactly that makes the four-player game more of a party game in a way and note with the four-player game you do not have to throw in any of the optional scoring you can just play four player so strongly recommend those waypoints because otherwise there is no way to communicate with your opponent now, to offset all of this pretty glowing praise, I do have a pretty significant complaint about this game, and that's how busy the tiles are. In addition to the features needed to play the game in Land vs. Sea, there's all kinds of whimsical artwork on them, and it's inspired by historic medieval maps, and while I admit the first couple plays, I like looking over the tiles and finding some pretty talented rabbits doing interesting things and discovering the Starbucks mermaid, these can actually get in the way of actually playing the game. Well, the extra turn and steel a tie symbols are huge. They're in the center of the tiles, which is great. The other important features can easily blend in with the other artwork. You notice this first with the X's or pluses, whatever they're supposed to be. In most cases, they're pretty clear. Like they're in bright white or bright black. I said, you know, high contrast black, I guess is a good way to put it. It's pretty clear, but then there are a number of other like cross-shaped pieces of artworks and Yes, when you pick it up and look at it up close, you realize, oh, it's a tent. That's not actually an X. You can tell apart well in your hand. You can't from across the table. Similarly, the portal and mountains sometimes kind of spread more than they should. Like sometimes it's a little unclear at a distance if that coral actually touches a specific edge of your tile. Now, again, when you pick it up, it's usually pretty clear. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that ends in this corner. That's not meant to go to this side. But again, it'd be better if you could just figure it out at a glance. If I look over and go, yep, that coral ends there. Yeah, and I found, again, on the tabletop simulator version that where I was learning, uh, because you can't necessarily, you know, bring the tile right up to your face, uh, there were a number of times where I'd plan something out, and then as I went to put it down, and you see the difference right there when those tiles are next to each other, you're mm -hmm. suddenly, oh, that doesn't actually work the way I thought it did. Time to rethink my entire strategy yeah. for, for the next four turns. And that was really disappointing. And it's something that is solvable. In my opinion, yeah, definitely. Now, the most egregious issue with this to me is the caravans and ships. Now, what they did do that I appreciate is these have white flags with little red symbols on them. 
And the only white flags with red symbols you'll find in the game are either on a caravan or a ship. They just wish they were significantly bigger. Instead, you get a little ship in the corner of the tile with a little flag on it, this little triangle. And I just wish they just blow it up, make those ships a little bigger. Like if you've ever seen me playing this game and I'm sitting leaning over the table trying to see stuff, that's me trying to figure out where the caravans are because I can't see it from sitting on a ta- at a chair across it. Now, I will say all of these graphic designs aren't terrible. They don't ruin the game. I just wish the important features stood out more. Like, I don't know, give them a drop shadow or give them an outer glow using Photoshop, something to just make the stuff that matters to the game pop. Though I do wonder with all this other artwork, if there's a possibility of expansion scoring being added to the game. That might be one of the reasons behind some of the other artwork, but I don't know if that's true. That's fair. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely, it's more cluttered than you'd expect. Yeah. Uh, and, and it would make sense that there are reasons for this, but as of right now, uh, it just feels cluttered. Yeah, I would, I would definitely prefer a little more clarity, right? Being able to design this game, it'd be all hexagons with lines on it, and it'd probably work better then it would look as pretty so i get it so overall we have been loving land versus sea everyone i have played it with has enjoyed it and that includes gamers of all experience levels over a rather large range range the basic game sorry the basic game of land versus sea is dead simple to teach and learn and games play nice and quick without feeling like they're over too quick at that level the, the basic game level, this game is a perfect gateway or family weight game. Adding in optional scoring systems adds depth to the game without making it feel complex, which made the game really shine for the hobby gamers I play with normally. The biggest surprise with Land vs. Sea, though, just how well it plays at three and four players, with a four-player team-based game being my actual favorite way to play this game. And it's interesting because we have talked about on this show a number of times the problems we have with rule variants when you have different player counts. Mm -hmm. It's been a complaint we've had, you know, don't, if you have to make a rule variant for a two player game, it shouldn't be in there. Well, this is the exception that proves the rule, I suppose, where the two player, the three player and the four player are almost different games. And yet they all work so very well. What this does not feel like is that they tacked it on. They didn't throw in some rules to make the player count on the box sound more appealing to more people. This is a game that feels like it has been fully play tested and developed at different player counts and doesn't feature simple variant rules just to make it work. They are stand almost like Sean said, almost standalone game, fully playable, fully tested, just as fun as the original, if not more so. I'm sure there are people out there that are going to prefer the game at two, and I know at least one person that loves it most at three. It's the fact that it works at all of them that is surprising. Like When you see Land versus Sea, you think two-player game. In a way, I worry that this is going to have the same problem Codenames Duet has, where people aren't going to buy it because they don't play two-player games. That is the one downfall I do see with the game, is that that, that the branding to me is like, look, I'm two-player. And honestly, I think it's better with more. Fair enough. The Land vs. Sea is the kind of game that's going to appeal to a very broad range of gamers. The optional scoring rules make this a great game for both new and experienced players, and also means that this game can grow with the group as they become more comfortable with hobby game mechanics. I honestly, at this point, have not played with anyone who did not enjoy this game. That said, where I think this game's going to fall flat is for people who like highly thematic games dice chuckers, uh, story-based games. This is an abstract strategy game at its core. It's about matching tile edges to complete patterns. There isn't really a story to be told while playing. If your group's looking for some kind of adventure or some kind of an experience game or to tell a story while they're playing, something they're going to be talking about for years to come, you're not going to find that here. In that case, you might be better off checking out Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing or, of course, many other adventure games that are out there. As for me, I just can't wait until we can start gaming in public again so I can start showing this one off to the local gaming community. I know a number of gamers who I think are going to love this. All right, well, that's it for our review of Land vs. Sea. Let us know what you thought about this abstract tile laying game in the comments. And also feel free to check out our more detailed written review 
over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode long ago. Yes. So despite it being quite a while since we were last year, I actually don't have a lot of gameplays to talk about. Uh, it's not just the podcast I've been missing out on lately. Well, I got in some physical games since Christmas. The rest of mine have been digital, as usual. So my first game to talk about is Galaxy Trucker 2021 Edition. Uh, this may be the first time I talk about this on the show. I can't remember. Um, but I have been playing the new edition of this. Um, we have explored more of it. So the game that I'm going to talk about here is when we played our first full run. So... The new edition of Galaxy Trucker has changed a couple things. So one of them is that the basic way to play the game is to pick one of three route sizes and play it. So you do a one route, a two route, or a three route using a level one, two, or three chip, depending on what size you want. And you just play through the one, and it makes it a quick filler game almost, like possibly half an hour to 45 minutes. The full game rules are now a variant way to play where you are going to do three runs. You do a run with a one chip, a two chip, and a three chip. So... That is a change from the original, though you can still play the old way and always do a full run. The new feature that is added to this game are what's called awards. You do your first run, and you only use this when you're doing a full three runs. You do your first run, and at the end, everyone's going to get a reward. So it's, it's, it's very, um, everyone gets a trophy, t-ball kind of thing. You're going to get to the end of the game, and you're going to look at all these things. So one of them is who got back with the most cargo. Another is who has the least open pipes. And then another one is... Uh, I'm trying to remember all of them, whatever. There, there's a bunch of different ones based on the different criteria in the game. What happens here is some players can win more than one, but you're only allowed to have one. So if you win more than one, you have to gift one to a player who didn't qualify. So by the end of your first round, everyone's going to have one award. And note you randomize which ones are in play. Like the game comes with like eight, but it's a four-player game. So you randomize which ones are available. And you know that before you do your run. So that's the important change here is while you're building your ship, you know what awards are out there, which I love, because now one of the problems with Galaxy Trucker is, especially for newer players, is here's all these components. What am I trying to do? What do I want to build? Where now you know, well, I might want to try to build a ship with no connectors, or I might want to build a ship that can hold tons of cargo, or so on, or has, has the most crew by the time I get back. Note the first awards you don't get anything for. You just earned it. Well, what that does is sets you up for strategy for the rest of the game. Now, when you run Route 2, you're now eligible for the award you got the first time. If you win it again, so if you now manage to finish your second run having the most cargo or having the least connectors, you now get bonus points. What this replaces is the old prettiest ship rule. So it used to be when you get back, whoever had the least open connectors gets points. That's gone. Now you score your awards. And everyone is eligible for the awards that they earn the first run. So you first run, you get eligibility. Second run, you can actually win the awards. If you win the second, you get to flip the tile over to the gold side, and it becomes way harder. So now it's you have to have the most cargo, but you can't have the same cargo stored in the same area. So your cargo has to be split over your ship. Or you have to have no open connectors next to each other or something. Or you have to have the most crew, but you can only you count each grouping of crew as one or something like that. So they become really hard. But if you succeed in them, they're worth like a ton of points, like 12, 12 bucks at the end of the game. That is the new thing that is in Galaxy Trucker 2021. Now playing through it, I got to say the game still seems easy. Like our ships just aren't blowing up as much as I remember them blowing up playing the game, the original version of the game. And I honestly don't know what it is there there's a strong chance that i've just played a lot of galaxy trucker and the people i'm playing with have played a lot of galaxy trucker and we know things like don't put open connectors on the outside edges if they're in the middle no meteor is going to hit them so you're fine or you know that the seven is the most common number to come up on 2d6 so you make sure you don't put anything very important in your sevens or you make sure you have shields facing those or whatever right like it could be that or it could just be bs luck that like when shuffling the cards we've gotten easy ones or there is a chance they made the game easier which honestly i could see because i know a lot of people that didn't like the original game because their ships just kept blowing up like it's not fun to just lose over and over personally i think it's awesome i want to get back where all i have left is a crew compartment and one piece of cargo and i still win because I, that one cargo is worth more than the other person's ship who came back 
So what I need to do is sit down and compare the cards, like literally take the deck side by side and see if they made it easy. So I don't know if it's an us thing or a game thing. I've got to say, if they did make it easier, I'm actually disappointed. That would be a shame. Uh, so for me, I'm going to start off with some of my digital plays and uh, some of our digital plays, actually, because I think the first thing that we have done a ton of and really sort of reinvigorated our love of a game that we have on this show spent a lot of time talking about, but that's Azul. Yes. Because Board Game Arena is getting a copy of Azul. Now, I don't know if it's still in beta or if they did finally release it, uh, but we jumped on pretty early as soon as we found a link available to it. And we have been playing the heck out of that. And it is just as good. Oh, yeah. uh, it is a fantastic uh, job implementing it. And thank God you don't have to think about the scoring and, and actually work out the scoring. It does mm -hmm. the scoring for you, which was honestly the hardest part about that game um, is, is remembering all the different scoring availability. Uh, you just get to sit there and play it and hate draft and, and play all your little tricks of, of, of how you're drafting. And it is just a fantastic way when you can't be together and play the game in person to get the game played. I am so on the fence over one thing, though. Well, I miss the tactile nature because Azul has such amazing components. I don't miss pulling out four tiles from the bag and having to fill that damn market every turn. And I'm like, so yep. I'm like, oh, I missed the tactile, but then it's so nice to just boop there. The market's filled. Let's go next yep. round. No, absolutely. I, again, it. It's a great game in person, but we can't do that. Uh, so let's play it. And this oh, is a great it is implementation. Definitely a fantastic alternative to playing in person. But if I had the option to do either, I'm kind of on the fence. Right. I'm like, I kind of, yeah, I'd rather sit together and play. Like, I, I don't know. I guess we could all have laptops sitting together and play. <laughs> I, but I, I do miss the physical nature. But yeah, that one's excellent. All right. The next game I got played is a brand new to me game, something I look forward to playing more. This is a review copy of Doodle Dungeon. This is from Pegasus Spiel, featuring art from John Kovalik, uh, who most people would know from the as the artist from uh, the Dork Tower comic, webcomic, and the Munchkin card games. He's done more work than that, but those are his big um, call to fames or whatever you want to call it, or where he's most well known. This is a flip and write game where you are going to start by drawing a dungeon it's a it's a drafting game you're going to flip up a bunch of cards pick a card then draw what's on the bottom of the card to your dungeon you're going to keep doing that until you get through the cards a number of times then you're going to pass your dungeon to the player on your right who's then going to play the hero and draw the path the hero takes through your dungeon of course there's a bunch of rules for how you can place things like walls can be placed anywhere monsters can't be next to each other or traps Treasure has to be guarded by a monster or else it vanishes and all that stuff. You can even level up your monsters, like have level 10 orcs instead of level 1 orcs. There's a whole bunch more going on. But the basic thing is draft to draw a dungeon, pass to the right. Then you pass it back and play through it. Now, all the cards you drafted to draw your dungeon have special abilities on them. You might have like an axe for orcs, or you may have a potion of healing, or you could have a, a jumps over trap card. You're now going to play those on your opponents as you track the path the hero meets. So you're going to follow the path till it hits an object, and then you're going to do it. And while doing that, you can play cards, and there's dice rolls to see if you hurt the hero and so on. This is way more detailed than I thought, and I made a mistake. As far as I know, we didn't play extreme, but what I decided to do is there are really three phases, in this, right? Drawing, drawing the path, and then playing it out. I know that that second part of the game, the path, is a huge impact on the first, which leads to your scores in the third. But I didn't want to have to front load it. I didn't want to have to sit there and describe where the hero is going to go and how the path's going to work and what it's going to happen to him and how many hit points he has, how the dice are. I just wanted everyone to draw their own dungeon. So what I ended up doing was going, you know what? This is a flip and write, right? Flip and writes are quick, right? Flip and writes, roll and writes are filler games. Silly me, I didn't look at the box. So what we'll do is we'll sit down, just play, just build the dungeon, make something that looks cool. All the rules make something that looks cool. Then we'll pass it off. We'll do the hero thing. And we'll be like, oh, okay. That's how I should have built my dungeon. Well, the problem was this game is not a filler game in any way. Um, this is, I wouldn't call it long, but for what it is, it's felt long. It took us over an hour for the first run. And this wasn't just because it was our first run. Like I looked at it and Board Game Geek, it's saying it's a 45 to 60 minute game. That's with experienced players who know what they're doing. 
And it became very obvious that we didn't know what we were doing in the first half when we got to the second half. What I really need to do is now play this again with the same people. We play with Tori and Kat and Deanna play. And this was at the end of the night. So we didn't get to that second run. Now, I will say it was fun what we did do. But do not, like, I, it's my fault. I, I was rolling right, flipping right, quick, right? That, that's the kind of games where you just roll a bunch of dice, you're done in half an hour. That's not this. There, there is a lot of strategy in this game, strategy being long-term planning. And there's tactics because of that whole card play. You've got a deck of cards, and do you use your axe for your orc now, or do you save it for that orc later? I don't know if there's a better way to teach this game. So to me... This is one of those games that needs a tutorial. This needs a quick walkthrough where maybe you only use like a six by six area of your dungeon to kind of explain it. Um, the way the AI works is not intuitive. Um, the rules for building paths aren't what I would call simple. So overall, this thing was just heavier than I thought. And because of that mixed expect or missed expectation, it didn't go over as well as I thought it would. Now, when I sit down and teach this to another group of gamers, I will be able to explain it. I'm like, hey, do you guys want to play? Like, uh, do you want to build a dungeon and fight heroes? Not a, hey, want to play a quick game where we build a dungeon, right? It's just, I, I need to present it differently. And I still honestly don't know the best way to teach it. What I'm thinking will probably work is now I have sheets that are filled out so I could show people. I could be like, look, this is the dungeon someone made and here's the path that was taken. All right, fair enough. Well, I guess for my second game, again, I'm going digital. Now this, it turns out, I actually looked, and it, it, I did actually start this before our last episode, uh, but it's interesting because I did the same thing as you did with Doodle Dungeon. I jumped in uh, without knowing what I was getting into. So I jumped in, and someone invited me to a play of Deus, which is a 2014 strategy game, card-playing, sort of take-over-the-world, share, shared map with gods and all this stuff. and. I figured, okay, sure, you know, I'll get in and, and play it. Well, we've been playing since November 24th. It's still not wow. over yet. I still don't know what I'm doing. Uh, okay. Honestly, I mean, I know how to play. I know how to put, you know, things on the map and, and move, move my armies around. Uh, I know how to sacrifice cards to the gods to get more resources. Uh, the game doesn't make any sense to me yet. Uh, Castle of the Burgundy, I knew I was doing things wrong, but it was making sense that I was learning along the way. I got no clue what Deus is about. And I mean, you're you're building a world and there's gods, but I don't know what how, when this game is ever going to end. Uh, it's listed as a sixty to ninety minute game on Board Game Geek, but I mean, we're into our second month now, <laughs> and we play Deus. I mean, we play this regularly. This isn't a game where it goes you know, five days without a turn yeah. being played. Um, so yeah, I, I do not no understand. No one knows what the victory condition is. Yeah, I, I keep dancing around the board or something. I, I do not know what Deus is. I, it's, so, it's an interesting one. I'm going to have to watch a uh, watch a play on it so, at some point just to figure it out. So Deus is a game I own. Okay. I brought it out to one public play event at the CG Realm. We yeah. muddled through it. It seemed excellent, but I never wanted to teach it again. Interesting. Because it was just, just I know it's about it, it, it's gizmos it, it's you're trying to stack the same god cards in rows to get them to be more powerful so say oh, you've got like okay. whatever an aries card and that lets you move a unit once i'm totally making this up well if you play another aries card you can now move all your units twice you can play it another time and you can now move all your units three times or like say Hephaestus just gives you wheat but one Hephaestus card gives you one wheat a second gives you more so it's a whole thing where you're trying to build combos of your god cards in front of you in a tableau where you're multiplying their abilities. Now, some of those influence things on the map and some of those other, and I totally forget what the win condition is, but I do know it's a game about building an engine. Like I said, to me, Gizmos is as close to it. Just in the the more cards you stack in this one area, when that goes off, all those cards matter. Well, that's interesting. See, I had not gotten that at all. Wow. So that's yeah, that's really the big part. That was the neat mechanic in Deus, was building your engine of, Interesting. I had not figured out this was an engine builder at all. Like literally wow. that had not even come close to clicking to me. So that's interesting. Okay. So there I, you go. I'm going to have to look at this in a whole new way now, apparently. So yeah, if that, we can add it to the when Sean comes down playlist. Cause really I should play my copy again. Mm -hmm. It's in my pile. I don't have a physical pile of this, but my pile of games to give one more try because I haven't played it and then give it one more try and decide to either get rid of it or start playing it more. 
And to be honest, uh, that's what happened. With, that's where Castles of Burgundy was for me, right? It was in my pile of, I, I used to like that game. Let's give it one more shot. Right. And then what we did, and I'm like, nope, that's staying on the shelf. Deus is, is on that fence of, I, I really need to give it another. Right. All right, my next game is Disney Sidekicks. Um, this goes with the shirt I'm wearing tonight, which you can't really see. So my daughter made me the shirt. I don't know if you can read it, but it says the first time that we play any game, we always play extreme. There's a bellhop bell on the back. Um, my daughter wants to point out that our graphic designer made an asymmetrical bell and then hers is better because it's symmetrical. And I pointed out, but I like asymmetrical games. <laughs> so you can't see that it's behind the hair, but I'm not going to bother turning around to show you the bellhop bell. So this fits because, well, our session of Disney Sidekicks, we most definitely went extreme. Uh, the thing was, though, we didn't do it on the first, so we, we didn't quite follow the rule. Because our first game, I think we actually played right. It was our second and third try of the game where we messed up. So quick summary, Disney Sidekicks. For one, you're going to see this box. You're going to look at it. It's got these silly figures. It's got the villains. It's Disney. You buy it for kids. No, this is not at all a kid's game. This is a hard cooperative strategy game from Eric Lang, the designer of Blood Rage and um, what was the, the, the Rising Sun and lots of other games. Fantastic designer. This is, this is not a Prospero Hall, let's put a pretty solid game with a Disney theme. This is a complicated strategy board game that many kids are probably now crying because Christmas hit and they got it for Christmas and they can't figure out how to play. So what you are doing is you are playing the sidekicks. Every sidekick comes with a hero, right? And they match each other. The heroes have been captured and they go in the center of the board in a castle. You then are going to move your sidekicks around the board and try to free your heroes. You're going to do this by unlocking the castle gate and then taking your hero out. To unlock the castle, you need magic because it's Disney. You need stars. You have to collect five stars to unlock this castle. You're going to do this by moving around the board, freeing villagers. So villagers pop up on the board here and there randomly, and you collect them. The villagers are all different colors. And when you collect them, you get to put them on your hero, and your hero levels up, which is actually really well done. You're going to get three cards that show three abilities, and they have so many spots on them. Well, if you fill a, a card with villagers, you now get this better ability. Um, you're trying to prevent the guards from overwhelming you at the same time. And this is one of those action point co-ops. So anyone who's played Pandemic is going to know. It's like you get three actions or you get four actions, depending on what hero you're playing. And it's one action to move, one action to battle a, a, a guard, another action to, hear, to, to rescue a villager. And at the same time, it's one of those games where the bad guys go, you go. So now it turns into horrified. Every bad guy is like having a different monster on the board and everyone has its own unique rules. So Gaston is trying to charm all the players because everyone loves Gaston. And you get these charm counters on your characters. Whereas Maleficent is casting curses on the very village spots. And if he casts a curse on a spot where there's a villager, they get captured. And everyone's going to play different. Scar attacks everyone. Scar has the, the Fausas, the hyenas that run out and attack people. And combat in this game is dice-based with special dice where you're rolling to hit to do damage and everything has health. Like it's just, it's a bigger game than you would think. It is not a quick, easy game. All of this, there's multiple ways you can lose. If any character is defeated, you lose. If five guards end up in the castle, you lose. If five villagers are captured, you lose. But the thing is, it's five total between guards and villagers. So if a total of two guards and three villagers are captured, game over. And that is the most common way you're going to lose, is the, the castle gets filled with stuff. You have to rescue every single hero. So if you're playing four players, you got to rescue four heroes. You also have to kill a villain. So you have to rescue all the heroes and kill at least one defeat, sorry at least one villain a lot going on really difficult so we sat down and we played the first time trying to figure out the rules it, the, the rules are a little ambiguous it's worth noting and here's another thing that's bad for a family game there is a revised rule book online that clarifies the rules of who's gonna go to board game geek or know to go to uh, spinmaster.com to download this on boxing day so their kids are playing with the proper rules right there there's my biggest problem with the game First game we played, we came close. This is me, D, Cat, and Tori. We play a lot of cooperative games together. We're experienced Gloomhaven players. We played through Pandemic Legacy. We play well together. We were close. Close enough that it was like, again, we got to try again. Here's where things went terrible. 
Well, the game has a villain deck that you build with cards for each of the different villains, right? They're all asymmetric. You shuffle all those together, and that makes your villain deck. And just like Horrified, the villains go, you do something. The villains go, you do something. The villains go, you do something. Well, in addition to this, in case you find the game easy, you can put in up to three bonus decks that make the game harder, extremely hard, and as they have it listed, impossible. Somehow, when cleaning up for round two and setting up, or round one and setting up round two, I shuffled all of them in. The game became so difficult that it wasn't fun. One round, the game ended before Tori got to take a turn. We had lost before it made it around the table. At that point, I was ready to toss the game out. I'm like, I'm done. Like, normally, I have to play a game five times before I give it a review. But at that point, I played twice, and I'm done. Like, like, this is broken. No one should buy this game. No game where a player doesn't even get to take a turn should exist, in my opinion. One of the reasons I don't like Flux, because I've had that happen. It was terrible. And we didn't realize until I was cleaning up at the end of the night, I was like, hey, where are the bonus decks? Because I want to make sure they're separate. And then I found out they were mixed in. So I need to review this one again. I, I need to re, 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 review my review. I have, to, I have to revise my review. This game is not necessarily garbage that should be thrown out. What I will say stands is this is not a kid's game. This is not a beginner's game. And the biggest problem with this game is, is that's how it's being marketed. Is it looks like a kid's game. It's ending up on Target and Walmart shelves. And the wrong people are going to buy this game. That's unfortunate. So for me, I've been playing a game that I actually have had some similar experiences like that, but not with the current set. So uh, despite problematic issues with J.K. Rowling's opinions on various things, my family is a fan, are fans of the Harry Potter world and in specifically the Hogwarts battle deck building card game. It's probably the favorite, my favorite kid's favorite game there is. Now, as we've talked about many times in the past, the Monster Box of Monsters is crazy difficult. We have still never finished it. Uh, in fact, it has kept the game off the table because the kids know how hard it is and they don't, aren't necessarily sure that they want to go in for that kind of disappointment. Well, for Christmas, the Charms and Potions box arrived and we decided to play again and we had a chat about Joanne Rowling's and uh, my kids are well aware that she is a transphobe. Uh, and they know what that means. Um, you know, my daughter's in high school, my son's in uh, grade seven, and they understand these topics better than I ever did. Uh, so we've had that discussion. But the game is still fun. And I have to say that Charms and Potions brings back the fun that was lost from the Monster Box of Monsters. And what I'm hoping is... Uh, and it's not super simple. We have, uh, you know, we've played now three boxes. Uh, we played box one and won it pretty pretty easily. Box two took us two tries. The first time, uh, again, we mixed everything in and started playing. And what we should have done is made sure we planned ahead a little bit. Because um, after getting crushed, we knew what was coming and were able to set up ourselves a little better and know how to plan. So that when we took it on the second time, uh, we stomped it pretty seriously because we had all the planning available to us. Nice. Uh, the third one, um, part of you, we the, the monsters that we randomized in and the uh, way the monsters came out or, and the villain or the villains, sorry, came out in the game made it punishingly difficult. Uh, but uh -huh. it was actually punishingly difficult enough that we were laughing about it. <laughs> um, it was, it was, I mean, it, there was no way we were going to win but it was fun. It wasn't, again, it wasn't Monster Box and Monster <laughs> Painful. This right. one was, it, it kind of crossed over at a really certain point of, okay, this is going really badly. We're not going to win, but let's, you know, let's see how fast we can lose. And it was literally, it, every person died every, uh, every turn around. Um, there was a, you got potion ingredients for, for different things. Uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll cover this if we ever do the review for the game. But uh, one of the things in this particular bug game was you got potion ingredients if some player at the end of your turn had 
10, like full a full 10 health. Uh -huh. It was once did we ever get that bonus because at the end of the by the end of the turn, there was never anyone with full health. But again, it's fun. And what I'm thinking is that this new all these new mechanics that are being added in through this box are hopefully going to make the monster box more fun and enjoyable mm -hmm. so that we can get through that. And then we will have all finally, you know, all three boxes available to us to enjoy and have fun That's with as a full complete game. And uh, we won't need to give any more money to a certain person. And we just have a really great deck builder that is very customizable because there's a whole bunch of new mechanics that have been brought in here. Uh, this the order they were released in was uh, Hogwarts, Monster Box, Charms and Potions. Yes, though they are very clear that you do not have to yes. play or finish monsters. No, absolutely, you do not have to have any of them. Uh, one of the they, they and they they have keep kept tweaking things uh, a little bit. So now, um, in Monster Box, they added the ability to once per game you're allowed to wipe the market. Now in this new box, the new setup is any duplicates stack on top of each other. Uh, and that's a great advantage that really makes the market more flexible, but also actually has some gameplay, like it works as part of the gameplay in some of the things that come up. So it's uh, it's definitely enjoyable. So did you keep in what you had unlocked for Monster Box? Yeah, games? absolutely. We haven't taken anything out. I'm just wondering if that might've made for that almost impossible win combo. Uh, it, possibly again it was like just... i'm just wondering if it might be easier to take out what you have done in monster box and play charms as if you hadn't started uh, monster you could i mean i don't really i'm too lazy to go through all that but realistically um it's very it was it it, it was just a pure this is about the worst possible okay. set of three villains that could possibly start sounds good all right so the final game i have to talk about is Quetzal from uh, Unidragon Games, or Unidragon whatever. I guess it's not game. Unidragon. Uh, this is the puzzle thing. I think I mentioned it on the show. Maybe it's been long enough I had not. At least I at least remember opening the box at the end of the show. But this is a four-part wooden puzzle. Laser-cut wood, very bright, vibrant artwork, high-quality, high-end puzzle. Um, we have, at this point, finished the final puzzle itself, the four pieces. Put them all together with the very cool linking pieces that make it into one puzzle. But we've only done the the quest, the the game part of it for the first three puzzles at this point. We we're so close. I was hoping this last couple of days we would have got it done. The puzzle's awesome. Like like the quality of this puzzle, how well cut the pieces are, the uniqueness of the shapes is really well done. The pieces are awesome. Uh, I, I love they they've added in all these unique shapes and, and by unique I mean like actual shapes of things like there is a literal minotaur with spiky horns holding an axe that's a puzzle piece that fits in there are dragons that are in there there's planes there's a rock and rocket ship like they're just neat pieces to discover while playing the game finding those unique pieces while playing is really neat then there's the quest part this honestly is pretty lame uh, it's it's Where's Waldo. That's all it is. There is a bunch of Where's Waldo puzzles that are find the five blue chests, find the stars, find the Yeti, find the red ninja, find the, it's all fine stuff. And then every puzzle has one maze. Now I knew the puzzles would have mazes, but I thought it'd be like a thing where you're tracing it through the whole puzzle. No, it's like the basket of one balloon has a maze that you can solve by instantly looking at it. Like, like the, the maze part was really just, I actually love mazes, but I want complicated, hard mazes. I don't want mazes a three-year-old can solve. Though, there is one neat aspect. All of these quests to find these things, at least some, I, I will detail it more in a full review if I decide to do one, but you're going to find these and while I'm building the puzzles, right? So I'm, 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 we're playing this game. We built everything. We're like, man, there's some weird shaped pieces. Like, like there's a series of pieces that have look like key ends on them. Or there's like pieces that have weapons, like axes and swords and tridents. And then there's the stars, like there, there's obvious star-shaped puzzle pieces as well. Well, once we started doing the quest, and I got my youngest daughter, because she actually likes Where's Waldo, so I will admit, she enjoyed finding these pieces. 
And the game comes with a piece of stick tack, literally for pulling out puzzle pieces. So you're like, let's pull out everything we have to find. Well, we noticed that every treasure chest are the pieces with the keys on them. And we noticed every ninja and, and I don't know why they're ninjas and, and mummies, but they're ninjas and mummies that are the bad guys. Every ninja and mummy one is one of those ones that has the weapons on them. And of course, the stars have the stars. And there's also butterflies. And you find the butterflies. Well, it ends up once you take these pieces out, they fit together, which is really neat. So you have a puzzle where you're pulling pieces out to make a smaller puzzle. And as far as we can tell, there are at least four of these. There might be more. What's confusing, though, is some of these don't seem to, like the Minotaur. There's a spot where it says, find the Minotaur and the people trying to defeat them. And in that puzzle, there's a Minotaur and there's a bunch of knights and stuff. And I think all we're getting out of that are wooden pieces we could technically play to duel with, you know, like army men. Those don't fit with anything else. So it's a little weird. I'm like, well, it'd be really nice if you told me what's just seek and find and what makes new puzzles. I guess that's part of the puzzle. Now, there are 3D figures you make with leftover pieces. Those are cool. They're nice. They're chunky. They're wood. I like them. Um, my final like thing, though, is this is not a game. Like, like they're trying to sell it as Quezzle. It's half quest, half puzzle. And I'm like, nah, it's a puzzle with Where's Waldo. And to be honest, I don't think that's all that unique. There have got to be jigsaw puzzles out there that have you find things in the puzzle. I, I don't know this because I'm not a big jigsaw puzzle. Fan. And the app is incomplete, which I know uh, a, another gamer. I'm not going to mention his name. Another podcaster has been raging, raging at them for not completing their app. Well, it ends up the app is a stretch goal for Kickstarter that wasn't reached. So they gave you an AR experience for the first puzzle, which is actually really well done. It's, it's, it's neat. I don't want to spoil it in case anyone does pick this up. Not that I'm giving a raving review here, but they, there was a stretch goal to unlock app integration for the other three puzzles. They never hit that stretch goal. So to be honest, they're not really selling you short, but they should say that somewhere on their website. Plus this podcaster also thought there was supposed to be assembly instructions for the 3D figures in the app. Now I will admit, I can't find anything where indicating that. And to me, the 3D figures were part of the puzzle. I've got these leftover pieces. What do I do with them? And I got to admit, they weren't necessarily easy to figure out. So, but the app, incomplete app like it and it says in development for the other three sections they're never going to do it when i wrote unidragon they're like no that is not part of our plans we did not reach our funding goal to create the ar experience we wanted to well then putting in development is a lie yeah unless they're going to launch another kickstarter and add it i don't know so overall a lot of mixed thoughts the kids are digging it the kids like puzzles and what's interesting is it worked well for our particular family the older kid loves assembling puzzles and she is adoring finding things. Oh, look, this one looks like a, a mermaid or looks at she's loving. The younger one doesn't like making puzzles, but is loving the quest, find the things. And then one of the things she discovered, which is again, not in the rules. So it's kind of odd is only the first quest told you to find the red ninja. Well, it ends up there's red ninjas on all the maps and they make a separate puzzle. Hmm. Why didn't they repeat that quest in the other? There's just some, there's also translation issues, serious translation issues. There's some badly broken English, an incomplete app. Like I, I just have such mixed thoughts on this thing. And I don't even want to mention the price of this thing. Like I realize high end puzzles aren't cheap, but this is a, to me, the price is astronomical for what you're getting. And the fact they sell it as you can buy pack one or you can buy all four with pack one, it's not complete. You don't have a complete puzzle. Even you have one section of a puzzle. And you don't get to play all the games. You don't get all the 3D figures. You just get one of them. Like, to me, it's a four-piece set. It should only be sold that way. There shouldn't be a cheap one-piece option. Especially when it gives you kind of incorrect expectations because there's an app for that one piece. You expect an app for the others. So I don't know. I, I haven't decided. As far as I can tell, as for us working with Unidragon, they are happy with the content I have produced for it. Here you have tonight some more of it. Um, I have YouTube pictures. I have stuff like that. And they love us and they want to send us more puzzles, which I'm probably going to agree to because my oldest daughter loves making the puzzles and my wife had fun making it with them. I will admit, I personally would not pay the price these cost. Now I get their luxury heirloom really well done. Like you wouldn't believe the detail on some of these shapes and the fact they slot in perfectly. Like there was no wiggling, like there was no stuck piece. It is extremely well done. It's laser cut MDF, right? 
and it's nice nothing's chipped so i don't know i i may or may not do a formal review it's probably going to be one of those if i don't have time to review something else off the pile of obligation i'll finally review quizzle as it is if you're willing to spend the money it's neat it's very well done if you like puzzles it's possibly worth it what i will say based on their boxing days wait for a sale because they seem frequent and I will say, if you do kind of plan on buying it, you can currently go there, use the code bellhop, all one word, and you will get 10% off anything you purchase there. So that does at least help with that price. All right. Well, now that we know about Quizzle, uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So one of the things is we need to finish the final part of the Quizzle, um, the part four of the map. And then supposedly there's something else with the app where we have a final answer which I don't want to spoil it, but I can't believe that was the final answer. Um, I kind of can tell because the answers are on the 3D figures and I built the 3D figures. So I read the words on the 3D figures and it, I'm not spoiling it. It tells you to do this. It's like, use them to guide your way. Having done an escape room in a box once, I can tell what's going to happen. Uh, but I do need to do it. And that's sit down with the youngest daughter and let her find the ninjas and the spies and the butterfly and the egg. Um, I have a pile of stuff to unbox uh, this year for Christmas. My, my game pile included Discover Lands Unknown, which is something I've been curious about for a really long time. That is the procedurally generated board game from Fantasy Flight where every copy is unique. It came out at the same time as uh, Keyforge, the deck building game. So we'll get to see my, my unique copy of Discover Lands Unknown. I got Dune Imperium. There's 2021 hotness for you. I won't be talking about it till 2022, but that is the, the Dune base based on the new movie. Um, mix of Deck building and worker placement. Supposedly never been done before. Interestingly, I also got Lost Ruins of Arna, which released the same week and features deck building and worker placement. So I get to be one of those podcasters who compares those two games, just like everyone else out there, and find out if I prefer Ruins of Arna, as everyone else does. Um, I've got the Command Station expansion for Space Base, which is mainly a box for the game and sleeves for the cards, but does include a set of new, new cards as well. So there's that. I got Underwater Cities, which everyone tells me kills Terraforming Mars. I don't believe it. Terraforming Mars is still one of the best games I've ever played, but I'm looking forward to finding out if that's true or not. I have Unlocked Star Wars, which I've never played an Unlocked game, so it'll be interesting to compare those to Exit. Now, I have heard they're too easy, but what's good about that is my youngest daughter is like, you are not playing that without me. So it came from the family, so I'm looking forward to playing that one with the kids. Then we have Downfall of Pompeii, which would be like, what the heck? Like, you want to talk about old, crusty games. This is an old Mayfair game about Pompeii exploding, where you are literally trying to outrun other people and you get to throw your opponent's cubes in a volcano. Uh, it, it is a uniquely themed game. And where that came from is Princess Otto had a board game selection for the holidays, and Dee was able to get both uh, Discover Lands Unknown and Pompeii for a ridiculously low price. So those were kind of like bonus gifts. Like, how could I not? They were so cheap. And well, there's something I'm going to crack open at the end of the show tonight. That's a big box there that says Hasbro Pulse all over it. So I am looking forward to diving into that. Now, as for what I'll probably actually do based on priority and the fact we do have games of obligation and we've been off air for a month is we got to finish off Quezzle, get those unboxings done so I can start opening them. I want to finish Forest of No Return for Aventuria because, as I mentioned when we reviewed it, we lost. So we still need to go back through that, try to finish it. And I need the kids to try Doodle Dungeon because I think they're going to dig it. And while some more Galaxy Trucker 2021 edition and finally sit down and compare the cards to see if it's us or if it's the game making the game easier. It could just be that eventually you get good at Galaxy Trucker, which then it changes to a very different game. <laughs> And now, a quick shout-out and a thank you to our VIP guests, our Patreon backers, who greatly appreciate their support. Evil John, thanks, Mr. Carney, and awesome to see you in the chat earlier. I don't know if he stayed for the whole show, but it was great to see his name there. Donna, thank you, Donna. Courtney Jackson, thank you. Mac Lichtenwaller, thanks, Matt. Roger Malash, who is dying to play games in person with me again and keeps reaching out. I'm sorry, man. We have two people in the family who are immunocompromised. Just not worth the risk to play some games. What I need to do is I need to get him on Board Game Arena and start playing some games with him. And try, we need to sit down with him and try his latest version of his Spider game. He mm. has 
Completely revised it, supposedly. All right. He still has the neat card thing at the bottom. Well, that was the double bell. Ah, uh, my coffee's done. We've been here long enough. It's after midnight. It's time to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com, and find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice anywhere you go. Links down below. And remember, throw us a review on um, what's that? The Spotify. That's what it is. Spotify now has reviews. Would love to see some reviews. There are a lot of people listen to podcasts on Spotify, so that's one of the places we would love to get more attention. Also, if you like the content we're providing and want to support our continued efforts, we've still got a Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellop where not only can you offer your support, where we can hope to make this show even better, you can get some cool bonus content. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. And stop by on YouTube Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.